Over to you, Chris. Okay. What do I do? <laughs> you just talk. <laughs> Am I on the screen? You are. Okay. Because I'm. Well, hi, everybody uh, out there somewhere. Um, I can only see a, a thumbnail of myself, so um, my perspective is a bit distorted. Um, okay, thanks very much for the introduction. And whether these are pearls or swine, I'm not quite sure uh, whether I'm the swine uh, in, in this talk. Um, I've, I've called it the idea of luxury revisited. Um, and that's because the book was published a long time ago. Just in people don't know it. Uh, where are we? Uh, this is the book. How can I get this angle right? Um, still in print. Uh, the cover uh, is nothing to do with me. Uh, the publisher chose that particular Andres painting, uh, not myself. So I excuse myself from any uh, thoughts that picture might conjure up. Okay, I'll start. It's, this will be about 25 minutes. Uh, also, the idea of luxury revisited. In this necessarily self-referential self talk, I offer some reflections on my book, Idea of Luxury, since its publication in 1994. I divide these reflections into three unequal parts. The book has a subtitle, A Conceptual and Historical Investigation. Though somewhat to my surprise, the book is regularly cited though often just as a name check, in contemporary academic commentary on luxury in marketing, business, advertising, consumer behavior, and so on. And in part three of these remarks, I'll allude to that literature. While in parts one and two, I attend to the subtitle. So the first part of these remarks refers to the conceptual dimension uh, to my discussion, my investigation. I want to start by very briefly outlining the set aspects of my argument before looking at questions and criticisms that it has raised. So a synopsis, a very crude and quick synopsis uh, of some of the things the book is trying to do. At the end of chapter one, I offer a definition. Luxuries are those goods that admit of easy or painless substitution because the desire for them lacks fervency. And I reach that definition through a lengthy analysis. The key building block is a conceptual epistemic distinction between need and desire. Needs are states of the world, desires are states of the mind. Regardless of your beliefs, humans need vitamin C, but whether you like soccer or dislike opera is down to you. I identify four categories of need, namely food, clothing, shelter, leisure, which as such are universal, everyone has them. However, because these are categories, they are generic and abstract. You don't eat food, but rather you want to eat sourdough or gluten-free bread, for the steak or nut roast, pork dumplings or tofu. As I say, these are concrete specifications or qualitative refinements, as I call them, and the same goes for the other three categories. These refinements are expressions of desire with different degrees of stringency. Whether you desire strawberry or chocolate ice cream is less stringent than the choice between kosher food or bacon. Luxuries are non-stringent desires, which are positively pleasing rather than the negative removal of pain. Or as I was put in the definition, they lack fervency. I identify them as treats. I want to pick up three other aspects or components of the conceptual analysis. The first aspect, I establish a five-fold taxonomy to it. Goods are A, deemed socially necessary, for example, household sanitation. B, goods are functional or instrumental. You need X for Y to Z. For example, a toothbrush for teeth cleaning to maintain dental health. C, goods can be fervently desired. I subjectively necessary, I must have for you. D, goods can be cherished, i.e. not substitutable, have sentimental value for you. And E, 
luxuries. Two corollaries of that taxonomy. First, the taxonomy is not static, but dynamic. The components are not mutually exclusive. In the book, I give the example of a Rolls-Royce car, which can be any of the B to E categories. Plus a good can move from E, the luxury category to others, which is why a luxury is a qualitative refinement and inherently transient. I stress in the book, at one time luxuries can become socially recognized needs, i.e. can move to A on the taxonomy. That's the first corollary. The second corollary, while not meeting needs is definitionally harmful and not realizing fervent desires can be distressing, there is no harm or distress consequent on non-possession or non-enjoyment of a treat. Conclusion I utilize in part four of the book when discussing the principles of taxation. The second uh, aspect or component, I establish a running hypothesis, namely that different evaluations of desire and different identifications of need result in different conceptions of political order. And I developed that in part four of the book in various ways. In the course of that development, I invoke the notion of a social grammar in broad terms of which I revisit the issue of the moral cases for need and desire, discuss means of poverty and illustrate by legal and fiscal, et cetera, policies. And the final of my three additional aspects, in the elaboration of the argument, I sustain a series of distinctions. And here I can just state them. Luxury is not to be conflated with expensiveness, with rarity, ostentation, and redundant superfluity. But I'll say a brief word about the last of these in my conclusion. So that's the synopsis of some of the themes in the book. I now turn to criticisms and responses. Of course, some of the examples in the book are dated, some of the evidence has been superseded, and inevitably, developments like social media, as well as extended contemporary literature, are not addressed. What I want to do here is comment on three more substantive contested areas. First area is a dispute about my needs and wants architecture, especially with respect to need, namely the charge that the epistemic difference undersells moral difference. According to the principle of precedence that I co-opt, needs trump desires and a fortiori trump luxuries. I don't think there's a problem here. My co-option does not contradict the analysis. My category of social necessary goods, IA in the taxonomy, recognizes that societies prioritize, usually through legal and fiscal measures, certain types of activity or expenditure. For example, some societies, such as the US, tax books. Others, like the UK, don't. These are not fixed and are always negotiable. And my running hypothesis deals with this. I do, however, argue, and I'm not exceptional in this, that the principle of precedence is not absolute. Trade-offs can be warranted. Hence, on the one hand, fulfilling desires can also have moral weight because the realization of my desires, my priorities, express my identity and validate my freedom. But since your priorities may well be different, then given mutual respect, in this way, a basic social pluralism is validated. On the other hand, needs themselves are never brute, but open to deliberation, not only individually, such as with respect to food, following a culturally prescribed diet or going on hunger strike, but also socially, in the form of legal requirements of health and safety, i.e. the first of my five categories in the taxonomy. However, the underlying criticism here is the argument that luxury has morally damaging effects. And though I have subsequently dealt with aspects of this in my discussion of remoralization, which I'll reference later, the fact that my book says relatively little about this issue does perhaps, in hindsight, signal my deficiency. The standard argument, which I take illustratively from Joanne Roberts, centers for the balanced account of what she, among others, calls the dark side of luxury, is that it's divisive. 
and stimulates degenerate and ethical and criminal activities. And in the current period of growing economic inequality, this dark side is increasingly overshadowing any positive moral impact of luxury. However, it seems to me more plausible to see luxury expenditure as a symptom of economic inequality or the iniquity of capitalism. It represents a misallocation of resources. Even if that, even if that is the case, two observations seem apt. First, liberal capitalist societies are scarcely the most defenders, and this misallocation rather characterizes the rule of dictators. Second observation, the production of luxury goods is not alone in the capitalist exploitation of so-called third world labor. If anything, cheap mass-produced goods are worse, and high-end luxury good producers like to invoke the inherent craftsmanship of their products, and craftsmanship, of course, being a salient buzzword in contemporary discussions of what makes a luxury a luxury. Another critique on somewhat similar lines is that I fail to distinguish between true and false needs. The argument that goods and services are constructed by an economic system to maintain itself and thereby to convince folk that they must have that item of luxury. So intensely are these felt but on that basis, John Armstrong and Joanne Roberts, for example, object to the painless substitution in my definition. My issue here is their underlying assumption about true needs, which I judge resist any definitive definition, and implicitly they are endorsing a version of my notion of fervent desires. I do, however, confess that I leave the notion of desire or want unproblematized. I simply declare further inquiry not vital, but that declaration is, I now judge, too preemptory. So that's the first area, a broad area of contestation about needs. The second area of contestation um, concerns my categories. Are my four categories, food, shelter, apparel, leisure, resilient? I do admit in the book that I have stretched them for example, perfume in the category of clothing. Historically, the first three as categories of need are unexceptional. Leisure might be judged more problematic and its inclusion has been criticized by, for example, A.F. Robertson in his book on greed. I am indeed defensive, but I do offer examples to support the case that comprehensively interpreted leisure as a universal cultural expression. And I also say that leisure is currently recognized in contemporary analyses of human need. Doubtless, leisure in my scheme of things could withstand further analysis. In retrospect, it is perhaps odd that I didn't refer to Veblen in this context. And I now think it could have been helpful to explore Aristotle's distinction between leisure as activity undertaken for its own sake, skole, from leisure as an instrumental recuperation from activity and apousis. A distinction which could have been developed alongside my argument that luxuries are positively pleasing and not a desire to be free of pain. Plus, if I was writing the book now, I would incorporate some reference to the growing emphasis on luxury as an experience of selling emotions, as the Bain report evocatively puts it in his report of earlier this year. And that, I think, that emphasis or experience would comfortably enough fit in my leisure category and not in itself discomfort my analysis. A couple of other critiques on this front. My categories are allegedly slippery and thus potentially confusing. So that in Fabian Saba's judgment, there's a need to tread carefully in analysing luxury along Berry's lines. Fair enough, I think. While Iliette Roux, as well as judging that my taxonomy is unable to account for change, also alleges that it throws no clarity on current usage. While her judgment is misplaced, her allegation does chime with an underconsidered aspect of my analysis, insofar as it is seemingly out of kilter with common usage. And I'll come back to that particular point in the final part of these remarks. Okay, the third part. 
No one, to my knowledge, has followed my, my book, Eucharistic Ambition. But on the conceptual front, I do luxury, but of course not monopolized discussion. In acknowledgement of that, I'll briefly mention three different approaches, different from each other and from mine, though they each reference my book. First of these approaches stems from Georges Bataille, who is invoked by Patricia Calafato, though she is not alone. Bataille has an overarching idea of excess derived from some notion of organic cosmic energy, which I read as more a Nietzschean villas or Macht than any Darwinian processes. Luxury in Bataille figures as an outlet alongside eroticism, work and war. The profundity that Califato claims to see here, I confess, just defeats me. The second approach is semiotic, especially as articulated by Dimitri Mortelmans. While he says I illuminate the philosophical discussions, he proceeds to adapt critically Jean Baudrillard's notion of sign value. His argument is complicated and I can't here do it justice. I do, however, detect a circularity in the analysis. It seems to presuppose what it aims to establish. As I remarked in my book, apropos of Baudrillard, signposts refer to signposts and not to destinations. More generally, I invoke what I call naturalism to explain why food and my other categories are indeed our need as needs can be objects of luxury. This anchors the desires, whereas the semiotic approach is too free floating. Moreover, I believe my analysis brings out the inherent transience of luxury, which accounts for why luxury and necessity exist on a continuum, not as polar opposites. And the third approach is the phenomenological one put forward by Lambert Dissing. He claims luxury is a form of aesthetic self-awareness that characterizes human freedom. So it's supposed to follow. A luxury has not to be purposeful, but is rather, and I quote, associated with an exaggerated, extravagant, irrational and superfluous effort. Stripped of its heavy handed post-Kantian philosophical baggage, I think my notion of luxury qua treat accommodates Bissing's claim that luxury is not phenologically purposeful. It is, of course, for others to judge whether any or all of these approaches are holds my account below the waterline. Not surprisingly, I think I'm still afloat. So that's the first part of these remarks dealing with the conceptual subtitle of my book. I now, more briefly, turn to the historical subtitle. My treatment of the history of thinking about luxury was deliberately and explicitly episodic. I made no attempt to provide an exhaustive comp comprehensive history. My episodes are the classical paradigm consisting of chapters on Plato, the Romans, where there's a lengthy comparative discussion of sumptuary law and the Christian contribution focusing on Augustine. Of these, the one the Romans was called forth most comment. I then have three chapters on the heading, the transition to modernity, comprising what I call demoralization, focusing on 17th century discussions of trade, then a lengthy treatment of 18th century debates, and then one on what I call the history of needs, which deals with Adam Smith, who was a prominent prominent presence in the previous chapter, Hegel and Marx. And my notion of demoralization has been widely adopted almost as standard and 18th century discussions have been widely cited. The episodes are of course primarily concerned with ideas or concepts. The book after all is called The Idea of Luxury. And I'm offering a sort of intellectual history. So it's a distinct enterprise from recent works like Peter McNeil and Georges Rilliot were concerned with what they call, quote, a very materialistic approach to luxury, by which they mean not marks, but objects. Another recent edited volume identifies this approach as a biography of objects. This is, of course, a perfectly reasonable approach. Though I do wish a bit more analytical rigor had been applied. 
I also think the same about Maxine Berg's work, especially her use of the notion of semi-luxury. I think my episodic ep discussions still stand up. My chronology has been criticised, but by my column of episodes, I was not committing myself to any strict periodization, and I never committed myself to denying that moralized vocabulary disappeared, and I've openly acknowledged that in subsequent writings. Are there those serious gaps? In retrospect, some do suggest themselves, though I perhaps appreciate these next points are a bit niche. I'll mention three possible gaps, that is. First, given, I think, justifiable space devoted to Stoics, I ought to have noted their main rivals, the Epicureans. I didn't do this originally because in the context, Epicurus's concept of ataraxia conveyed effectively the same message as the Stoic apatheia with regard to the worthlessness of luxury and an advocacy of the simple life. Nonetheless, especially as promulgated by Lucretius, Epicureanism came in Christian thought a byword for moral degeneracy. As I noted, one of my episodes is the Christian contribution. Uh, the footnote, David Cloutier, in his explicitly Christian remoralized critique of luxury, makes ample use of my book, generally, though perhaps strangely, not that chapter. I'm partly against the backdrop. Epicureanism, Christian backdrop, that is. Epicureanism played a role within early modern demoralization debates. My excuse for not discussing it, discussing that role, is that it was not directly apt to my chosen focus on 17th century debates on trade and commerce. Well, I could indeed have been more forthcoming why those debates were my focus. Furthermore, given I do invoke Hobbes, it would have been appropriate there to recognize why contemporary judges, contemporaries judged him negatively as an Epicurean. So that's the first sort of gap or issue uh, from the historical dimension. A second one is this. Alison Scott says, I move swiftly over the Renaissance and Catherine Cavesi also reproves me because I omit it from my discussion. Indeed, the Renaissance could well have been an episode. Its inclusion would have enabled me to say more about ideas of magnificence and their relation to luxury, <clears throat> which I only touch upon in my discussion of ostentation in the opening chapter. And Cavesi herself argues that the Nihilism Lusso was coined by Leonardo Dati in 1441 to identify a new phenomenon of consumption distinct from both the Roman usage, in which magnificentiam was linked to public display, and in my book I quote Cicero precisely that effect, distinct also from the medieval expression where it became a synonym for lust. I discussed the link between luxury, lust, and lechery uh, in the Christian contribution chapter. However, as Gervaisi acknowledges, the Roman negative usage resurrected itself. So this era, i.e. the Renaissance, may indeed be aberrant. Third issue here. Given the territory covered, are there misplaced emphases? Two possibles come to mind, which I acknowledge in my preface, actually. Aristotle could perhaps have been given more space since his historical legacy is crucial. But I chose Plato instead because he most clearly exemplifies my hypothesis about needs, wants, and political order. But Aristotle could have played that role, albeit less crisply. And the second misplaced emphasis is that I should have said more possibly about Rousseau's first discourse and less perhaps about Smith, especially since he appears in several chapters. So I now move to the final part. And this is looking at some clarifications or expansions uh, on my part since the book, or thoughts about clarification expansions since the book. I here put to one side amendments I could make to the material discussed in the various episodes and instead pursue a couple of other points, effectively re revisiting some of the conceptual material. In my keynote at the first IPOL conference, I coined the term remoralization, and in a version of that lecture has been published in the book 
critical luxury studies, edited by Armstrong and Roberts from Edinburgh University Press 2016. So I'll not here rehearse that, safe to say that in that uh, lecture come essay, I identify three streams of remoralization, the ethical, the social and the green, each of which disputes what I call in the book, the innocence of luxury. This afternoon though, I want to pursue the question of that why, despite remoralization, luxury is resilient, indeed seemingly booming, and how that bears on my argument in the book. And in so doing, I will honor the promise I made earlier attached to my comments on the roof. According to my definition, luxury is an indulgence, permitting pain of substitution. And though I take my cue from the assumption in contemporary advertising, yet when seen against both unreflective and commercial usage, as well as much academic commentary, my conceptual analysis might seem to sit oddly. That dissonance or ambivalence hinges on what we can call the instrumental stringency of luxury. My gloss of the prevailing literature identifies four reasons for of functions performed by luxury consumption. Goods are desired, one, to project power. The magnificence of the court of Henry VIII as portrayed by Holbein, have at one's disposal the fleet of private jets and yachts scattered over the globe. Two, guns are desired to establish status to own a Birkin bag for a private island. Three, to demonstrate group membership through brand recognition and so on. And fourthly, as a way to feel good about yourself, so-called self-gift giving. However, these desires can be fervent. I must exhibit respectively my power, my being ahead of the game or connoisseurship, my tribal membership, my sense of self-worth. Thus understood, the reason for having wanting luxury goods is stringent. In line with my conceptual analysis of luxury, here any substitution would be painful, insinuate, insinuating respectively, relative impotence, loss of prestige, being an outsider, and a quasi-pathological lack of self-esteem. But if these are luxuries, then they can be easily substituted. Stringency is a matter of degree, since like all desires, those for luxury are amendable. If no substitution is acceptable, as when a collector needs the missing piece, regardless of its relative rarity or relative expense, then talk of luxury is inapplicable. So a Prada handbag, say, can be ambivalently, fervently desired or be an indulgence. But it's only in the latter sense, is it on my analysis properly a luxury good? From this, it follows that what constitutes a luxury is not conterminous with commercially branded luxury goods. Having a pleasant meal, not from Michelin star restaurant, buying a pleasing knickknack, not a Fabergé egg, purchasing a delightful dress, not a Chanel suit, Hiring a babysitter to go to the cinema, not a jet to mystique, are all equally luxuries. It might now be thought reasonable to conclude that my analysis is irrelevant to the voluminous literature that investigates the lived world of luxury consumption. But I can contest that conclusion on two grounds. First, my analysis by rooting desires in four universal needs accounts for the range of commercially identifiable luxury goods that are not commonplace, but possess a high degree of qualitative refinement. Second, my analysis underpins the truth in the cliche, one person's luxury is another's necessity. But I do now think I should have made those two aspects more explicit and salient in the book. And this leads me finally into a clarification about my fivefold taxonomy. Luxuries E in the category, in the taxonomy, to repeat, are not A, socially necessary, C, firmly desired, D, cherished. But I should have been clearer on the relation to B, the functional instrumental toothbrush category. To pick up another example, while a Rolls Royce could be a luxury, it is, as a car, still an instrumental means of transport. Ross just said, a meal in a Michelin restaurant is still a meal. As I argue, though luxury has a qualitative refinement, 
is a painless forgoable superfluity, this does not mean it is redundant. To adapt another illustration from the book, in order to get an outcome you desire, you need to sign a document. And given the way the world is, then the sick of celery wouldn't be useless for that task. You need a writing implement, and a Mont Blanc pen could do the job. But quite luxury, it could be painlessly substituted for any number of alternatives. The Mont Blanc is an indulgent, as an indulgent, if not purchased or possessed as an instrumental necessity. Indeed, it could be less efficient than a ballpoint. It is in that sense that it is something distinct from the toothbrush and is a separate character category, i.e. on my earlier list. But even as an indulgence, a luxury, like in this case, the Mont Blanc pen, it is not useless. To conclude, I suppose, I hope, that over a quarter of a century and still in print, the idea of a luxury has shown itself not to be useless. Thank you all for listening. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Um, I found that it was uh, great, insightful reflections. Um, and also just congratulations on 25 years um, for the idea of luxury. And it's great to have you here today. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad I can be part of this today as well. Um, so I'm here representing Intellect Books and Journals. Um, so I hope you can all send in lots of questions for the Professor um, and also for the panels as we go forward throughout the day. Again, just on behalf of Intellect, I'd like to say we're really happy to be working with the High Poll and we're very excited to have published these two special issues and uh, to, to be working towards publishing a journal that will focus on the subject, which I think really shows, um, you know, how, how much the, the impact of the idea of luxury has had that we now end up with, a, you know, a peer reviewed journal that will be coming out two to three times a year. There's that much wealth and depth of material. And again, having all of you here today uh, again reflects that, too. Um, so now, though, I would like to bring in to this in conversation, uh, Father Andrew O'Connor, who is a Roman Catholic priest and pastor at St. Mary Grand on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in New York. Um, I'm, I'm calling in from New York as well today. Um, but also he's a designer and a founder of Goods of Conscience, which is a, a non-profit clothing company. Um, so, Father Andrew, can I bring you in? Yes, indeed. Good, good morning to you. or Good afternoon in, in England. Good afternoon, sir. No, I'm, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking uh, Professor Berry for those wonderful reflections on his work. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Berry. It was very much uh, useful uh, to go through not only your uh, your work, reflect on it from uh, the and your reflections today uh, were were very good and and concise, both your concepts and your history of luxury. Thank you. Well, I mean, I want this to be an informal conversation, so I'm going to kind of pose a few questions, but I'm going to let you two really just kind of flow with the conversation. And again, if anyone in the audience has a question that they'd like me to put to either Father Andrew or Professor Barry, then please do just um, send those in now. Um, but perhaps I could start with uh, by asking you, Father Andrew, what you feel the, the, the most important impact of uh, the, leg the idea of luxury has had. I mean, what, in those 25 years, what do you think is the, the, the legacy? The the uh, uh, the organization uh, philosophically that um, that uh, Professor Barry brings to it is is useful. I think he said himself that um, those uh, those four categories are very sturdy categories of the 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 matter of luxury still con concerns this uh, place between. Uh, what's uh, a necessity and a, and a, and a want, uh, our food and shelter, uh, clothing. And, and, I, and I'm grateful that he insists on leisure as well, a place to reflect on, on our life. So um, those are very important issues. Um, I think um, I'm entering into the discussion, not as an academic, but as somebody who's a, I'm a Catholic priest who knows something about the luxury market and, and all the, uh, the problems of uh, cultivating the work that's associated with it. So um, what I took away, uh, first off, from the, the discussion of luxury is 
what a loaded word it is. Am I right? I mean, it's a uh, uh, luxury is like one of those words like death, where everybody thinks they know exactly what it means, but when you really investigate it, it's, it's quite difficult, you know. Or I think really it should be uh, think about the word love too. Like, what do we really love? Or, you know, what makes it significant in our lives? So um, um, the, the matter that I think was really valuable to, uh, to me from Professor Barry is how uh, he, he does give homage to Aristotle, right? And he speaks about uh, uh, the problem that we have today is still an, an Aristotelian uh, uh, problem of categories of uh, what's the good that's being, uh, or teleology, I guess, is the word that uh, professor speaks about, you know, like, uh, have we jettisoned the idea of, of, of a goal to civilization and uh, to people's work? Um, if that's true, then the, uh, the dominant teleology of Western civilization, though, still has its the mechanism of progress in it. And I think that's an important part to have a discussion about is uh, uh, something of its, of its history. Um, uh, I'd like to be able to speak to Professor Barry about some of the transitions between, he's, he's got an episodic treatment of, uh, of luxury through the ages and so sometimes you want to, I, I would like to, to play out where I see a lot of the nuances of transitions from one era to the, to the next, from the Roman, for instance, to the Christian, from the Christian to, uh, say, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, from the Enlightenment to today. So uh, those are just a few comments. Can I respond? Yes, please do. Please um, do. I'll just call him Andrew. Uh, you just call me Chris. It's yeah. a conversation, so let, 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 let's be on. Let's be friendly uh, yeah. about this. Um, is, is actually both formal and informal, so forgive me for that. Yes. Um, okay. Right. Uh, I'm not Christopher, though. That's the equivalent. Um, well, I, I thank you for that. I mean, a bit of biography, if you like. Um, I got into this subject. Um, partly through curiosity uh, and partly through being intrigued um, by two things. One, um, how historically the notion had changed uh, from being something bad to something okay. Uh, what was going on in that transition? And the other thing, it was for me, a sort of entree into a, a set of questions that I had uh, given my academic sort of about a very specialism, which is political thinking. Um, and I thought, look, it was a way of thinking about uh, how societies decide between what's important in their lives and in their policies, in their habits, and what we think is less important. Um, and the luxury necessity dynamic in that sense seemed to me to be a, a useful way in um, to, to thinking about those things. So I'm glad in the sense that you saw something like that in your own reading of the book, that this is, um, that I was trying to delve into those sorts of issues, which very quickly get very deep and big. Um, and of course, I only scratched the surface in certain, in certain points about that. The point about, if I just elaborate a little bit here on the four categories, um, one of the things that I picked them for was because I wanted to use them as universal standards, universal markers of what it means to be human. That human beings, wherever, whenever, in many respects, in all respects, in some places, um, eat, have clothes, live in dwellings, and have this generic term, leisure. Uh, and it's because of that, which is something that comes with the territory of being inhuman, that it enables the distinction in luxury and necessity to start work. So luxury comes in as being anchored, as I put it in my remarks just now, to these needs. They're not free floating. They are ways, they're refinements of 
what we eat, what we wear, where we live, and what we do with our time. And luxuries is our degrees of refinement of these basic needs. And we have them as individuals or as societies to some extent, but the needs themselves are just categories. There are ways that, that uh, human beings are and how they have organized themselves conventionally into societies. So it was investigating all that complex uh, that the book was about. Uh, um, now that you're right about transitions, of course, and I episodes, I, I duck that question <laughs> and that's partly deliberately uh, because otherwise it, it, it blows into, it blows out of proportion. I mean, it, it becomes a history. Um, and there was a, a, a late 19th century French scholar, uh, Baudrillard, uh, who wrote four enormous volumes. They're about, I don't know, I did look, I did sit through them in the library. Uh, and re each volume has got something like 800 pages. And it starts in the Stone Age and ends up in Fin de Claparis. Um, and the thing is just wearying. I mean, it's just like a catalogue. Uh, and I wanted to be more analytical than that, sharper than that. Um, and so the episodic approach was simply to highlight certain highlights uh, of, of the issues. This, this particular episode brings out this to the fore. This episode brings that out to the fore. So the Christians brought out the, the, about, about the notion of sin, for example, and the notion uh, developing the notion of the body in a particular sort of way. Uh, the Enlightenment is about the development of progress. Sorry, that's my phone going off behind me. My wife will pick it up, I hope. Excuse me. Always the way. We'll just give a sweet time. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. It's called living at home, working from home. Uh, that's all I ever do anyway. I don't, I don't, I don't work at, in an office anymore. Um, I work at home too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks to so, so, Yeah, so, so I was, as I was trying to say, I think, um, it was trying to pick out why these episodes picked on, I used them to try and develop, in a sense, the richness of the ideas. Mm -hmm. plus the mobility of them. Uh, so Plato was about need and desire. The Romans were about the, the notion of corruption and, and how to prevent corruption. The Christians, I say, were, were about the, the threat of the body and corruption in that sense. Uh, and then to the demoralizing, its development towards a, a change in the concept of nature uh, from a, a straightforward, a clean theological notion to a more materialistic uh, notion. Um, that it's, it's, it's not why things happen, but how things happen becomes important. Um, mm -hmm. The nature is a matter of something, not the final causation of something. And that has links to ethics and has links to um, what I did focus upon is how the importance of trade and commerce develop. And then the, the chapter on needs was again to think again about needs where I talk about Marx quite a lot. Then the mm -hmm. final part of the book is going back to this to the to these sort of categorical discussions about what societies value and by looking at what they tax for example uh what the laws are that they pass what the habits they have tells you something about that form of society it's about an identity or grammar as i call it so those were the sort of things which i'm i'm, I'm pleased that you think about and we can pick up more specific things later but as a sort of general response uh, i'm just it was trying again to indicate um, why the book uh, is what it is. Um, and it's, in a sense, I'm surprised by its reception, if, to be honest. Uh, uh, I didn't think it would have as much resonance uh, as it clearly has. Uh, thank you, Cliff. Um, oh, sorry, go on, Father Andrew, I'll, over to you. I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the, when you began the book and the, the, you, you seem to feel there's a dubiousness about including leisure or yeah. in England, but um, and and that's that's an that's an important juncture to speak about because the um, one of the the clear modern problems how we're so different from the classical age is our relationship with work 
Um, and in, in some ways, the way in which uh, luxury tries to propose itself is, uh, you know, this uh, satisfaction and fulfillment, a, a sense of measuring your own self-worth by reflecting on it in, in some way in your house or when, you, when you've, you've, you've stepped away from work. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, um, the Marxists, you know, are interestingly uh, teleological, aren't they? I mean, because they, they feel that uh, by, um, you know, taking apart culture and uh, the relationship between, uh, they want, they want to, to heal, Marx did, the, the, uh, the sins that he rightly spoke about with consumerism like what's it really happening to the common man and um but what marx brought about was something you know a, a very imminent and uh now it feels almost like a quaint uh, uh view of work uh the man who goes to work and um for us today um our relationship with work is is so restless um, and, and invasive. Obviously, now with Zoom, it's it's really in our homes. You know, we can't really do much to suppress the real part of our our domestic life. Um, so leisure, in, in a way, says, "Well, uh, we'll make a choice." You know, are you are you are you working to live? Or are you living to work? And uh, so that those are, and that that's a wonderful uh, way to go back to Aristotle, you know. So a Aristotle, when he speaks about virtue, so if he says if you want to be happy, you have to uh, you have to virtue is what you need. You need to strengthen yourself to do that, which is going to make you happy. And there's two different categories of virtue. Aristotle says he says there's. Well, there's intellectual virtue and something that, that uh, you might only uh, realize at the end of your life with a very good teacher. You know, you went to a great place and somebody really opened up your mind and you, and you worked at it and you have intellectual virtue. Moral virtue, he says, is something quite different. It's something that he insists must happen at the very beginning of life. And moral virtues um, are, you know, he says it in that simple way, which is, uh, well, not so simple for Aristotle, but that we're all tempted to have towards pleasure, you know, that you, we work hard and there's things, and, and also we have adversity to pain. And if we're going to do something noble or do something that is worthwhile, we have to confront and overcome pain. And um, so the moral virtues are things that needs to be uh, instilled into people at a very young age. Where that really impacts us in the modern era is the Rousseauian notion of rights, you know, uh, the, the volonté générale, you know, where the I'm going to decide what it is that I need to have that's going to make me happy. And um, with, with rights, then you sacrifice the common good. And, uh, so, uh, and so in some ways, luxury then points us to a problem that we face in our life. You know, does it, or does it somehow um, tempt us to separate ourselves from other obligations? Does it, um, what effect does it have really on our culture? Um, a wonderful dialogue right now is about the dialogue of craft. You know, the, uh, if you, you know, if suddenly all these global chains of, of commerce and production have been interrupted during the COVID crisis, we can see how, how vulnerable we are. Well, who knows how to do all these crafts? Um, what about the people that actually work that might be people that are neighbors? Do they appreciate, you know, what, what they've been working at? If they've been working so hard and they think, are you paying them enough for it? You know, that you have to face that with a 
with with uh, your neighbor. But with Aristotle, then the um, the morals also need. Uh, he says, for most people, happiness is associated simply with pleasure. I'm I'm you know, and it's variable because he says if if you're sick, boy, pleasure would be being healthy, or if I'm poor, you know, pleasure would be, I wish I won the, the lottery or I was rich. Um, he says, then there's another class smaller than that, which wants honors and says, um, I would love it to be, uh, you know, the kids dream about being a uh, football star, uh, this football or the kick kick, whatever. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, they want honors, but they're bestowed on other people. And then Aristotle would say, the highest uh, happiness is one that you do for your own sake. Yeah. So I'll leave it at that. But it, it was just interesting about the, the way in which lux luxury works, maybe the experience of luxury then begins to display uh, a spectrum of what that might be, you know, uh, whether you know, it's uh, Nike always professes that it itself is, it's not really a shoe company, it's a marketing company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Kellogg's com comment, isn't it? That Kellogg is not in the business of making conflict, but making money. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's the same sort of, you know, uh, image uh, about that. Yes, because Aristotle can be used in all sorts of ways. Um, and and you, obviously you, you can adapt uh, the intrinsic instrumental distinction um, in lots of ways and significantly, I think, possibly in the context of what we're talking about. Uh, I mean, for him, the, the virtue, arete, is, is an excellence of the person. It's an excellence in a way. Uh, so it's, it's being what you can be uh, as your sort of personal telos and isn't to be uh, overtaken by, as it were, corporeal matters in the end because they're less important uh, and that develops into sort of post-Hellenic philosophy uh, into asceticism at one level but also into a very strict austere ethic uh, whereby the pleasure should be eschewed altogether um, and of course this is one of the transitions that my episodes talk about is, is how pleasure in a sense changes um, in a way now in terms of the in a way Leisure and work, yes. I mean that that that, that is important, um, and I was trying to you pick up on leisure because, in a sense, it is you know, student distinction. It is not simply something that's recuperative. It's something that, that in a sense, in, it's an enabling capacity that humans have to have. So all societies have outlets for uh, celebrate celebrations, ceremonies, rituals, and so on. These, in, in many ways, are instantiations of and exemplifications of things that they value. And mm -hmm. so leisure can be linked very quickly, I think, to some forms of social values. Uh, and they can take the various sort of form. They can take the form, for example, in potlatch of destroying goods. But what potlatch does, the, the, the North American, I think oh, yeah. the Northwestern Canadian uh, tribes, uh, make a point of coming together and demonstrating in a sense the social solidarity uh, by giving up things. Yeah. Uh, and the point of that, that in a sense is that these are don't matter. What matters is the fact that we are the tribe, we are we. Uh, yeah. and so it, that in a way is where you, they're using the, the stuff of the work to another different end. They're using it in a way of, of social uh, confirmation. Uh, and the, what you touch on towards the end there in a sense is the is this sort of threat that luxury is supposed to pose to uh, contemporary mores in a way, because what it seems to do, certainly by a lot of writers, it seems to sap this, this sense of obligation, this sense of um, community, the sort of bowling alone phenomena that the, the, the sociologist Robert Putnam talked about a while back, that people become privatized uh, so luxury is, in a sense, is for me, uh, and by doing that, the public is neglected. This seems to me, in principle, a sort of contingency, in a way. Your, your criticism lies somewhere else, 
and luxury is simply a manifestation of it um, and not a necessary manifestation of it, mm -hmm. just as uh, gift giving can be to the self but can equally be to others you can fulfill yourself by making other people happy uh and to reduce that to self-interest is, is a, is a uh, a misconception of what's going on so you can misconceive luxury in some respects it seems to me uh, by simply saying that it produces these bad effects but the bad effects are in a sense contingencies it seems to me um and my analysis allows you to, to make that distinction it doesn't say luxury is good, it doesn't say luxury is bad, it just says that luxury performs in certain societies certain sort of rules of operations uh, and these in different societies are valued differently. Uh, so what counts as you know, luxury in medieval France is, is building a great cathedral, not a luxury, that's a necessity. That's a way of demonstrating uh, both our smallness and the grandeur of the universe at one level. Uh, now, and certainly in Britain anyway, churches turn into hotels or they turn into car showrooms uh, and so on, that they're used differently. Uh, and now, in fact, we can, we can um, pre preserve church buildings, not because they are, in a sense, because they're aesthetically important. Mm -hmm. So now what you do in a sense, you say, this is an important building. Um, therefore, we can tax people, maybe, uh, to maintain the fabric of it. Yeah, that's the point that you made at the end of your book, actually, was do we, with um, maybe in the end of the 90s, there wasn't a lot of funding for housing. And so you're saying, well, do we put our valuable uh, you know, funds towards maintaining medieval churches or do we build homes? Yeah. So that, 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 and that's it. That's what I was trying to say earlier on about where I got the interest in, in the topic is how, in a sense, what I call political order or political grammar, uh, mm -hmm. social grammar works in that way. You can tell about society what it values. Does it, for example, support medieval cathedrals or does it put all its money into building houses for the, yeah. for the others? I'd love to interject at that point about, uh, you, know, you mentioned about potlatch. And yeah. um, in um, in a medieval monastery, um, there was always a, a cloister, right? So the uh, the cloister is a square <laughs> um, garden, and it's an image of the Garden of Eden, right? So you 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 were speaking about lapsary post lapsarian uh, uh, desires and pre lapsarian, so there. That that construct was there in the in the monastery, usually next to the monastery, uh, into the, the garden, the cloister is a chapter room, and uh, uh, there was an, it was just an interesting example that uh, there was the the rector of uh, of the Duomo in in Florence, Christopher Verdin, an American who's an art historian. Um, uh, showed us uh, in in one monastery the uh, the chapter room, and he noted that um, in the uh, in Florentine society, you know, at the time of of Dante, just before the Renaissance, or maybe where it began, um, while there was the war between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, many of the same family members would be there in the monasteries as monks. They could be members that came from an aristocracy. Uh, they'd also be from the poorer classes. They'd all be wearing the same habit. And, and just to sort of what it tells you is that the chapter room was where they, they confess their faults. It was always right next to the cloister. And so it's a place to, to create peace and restore the garden, you know, re restore I guess an image of, of luxury is the Garden of Eden, you know, the place where you don't have to struggle for the bounty that's in the world. Um, that, uh, you know, so there's, there's a, an, uh, an image of the work or the renunciation of, you know, as the monks have poverty, chastity, and obedience. And, but then they, 
that gives them an entree into the garden, into a place of luxury. It's, an, it's a model that's there um, uh, for sharing. And so in your final um, question, you didn't really answer the question at the, or didn't take one side or the other when it came to the problem of, well, should we uh, in, indulge in maintaining medieval churches or build homes? You know, like it's, 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 a, it's a hard question. Um, like, um, so, but in some ways the, the, the medieval church has this idea of maybe there's more of a profusion of wealth in that sharing, you know, the, the, the work of both renouncing and then celebrating. Um, that's a, a theme from Dostoevsky as well, which is the question of um, Boots or Shakespeare, he says, you know, like, the, is it possible that the, the um, through the thing that you might think is most unnecessary, like Shakespeare compared to Boots, would be the one that offers the most abundance and uh, real sustenance to the entire human person. Ora Labore. Uh, yeah, Ora Labore. Yeah, I, I love Ora Labore. You're right. Um, yeah, and I, think, I, I don't think that, that I, I'm not I'm not a legislator, so and, and so I think it's some society will decide differently about. As you know, there's a big debate in, in about Notre Dame burning down. What should we do about it? Uh, yeah. And that was more because it was a symbol of France than it was a cathedral, it seems to me, looking at the arts. If you look literally the, all the debate that took, what should we do with Notre Dame since the fire? Uh, most of it seemed to be patriotic mm -hmm. language rather than theological language in many ways. Uh, this, this is an important uh, symbol of France. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, as a symbol of France, we ought to restore it, mm -hmm. uh, not because it was a cathedral as such. Our, I my personal uh, take. That's how I read that. Yeah. Our, the Americans, the Supreme Court in America uh, considered uh, a, a very important case about a, about a cross in, uh, in Maryland. But during the week, Holy Week of that year when Notre Dame burned down, or the, the roof burned, and they, they considered that issue, which is really, you're, you're right, that the, the issue of symbol, you know, well, well, what is it? Can it be just a church or can it really symbolize France? Or because it transcended France, didn't it? it uh, there were the outpouring actually came outside of France because yeah. the reaction where people were, you know, they, they felt it was a, a universal patrimony. Um, but maybe that that is actually the 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 the, the play of uh, of symbol, which is important in uh, luxury. You know, like it's um, what it uh, um, there was a, uh, a this is an example from James Joyce, where he was speaking about a uh, a meal and uh, of in a very impoverished family. And uh, he said that they, they hung up the salmon or the fish in the middle of the table and they put potatoes on forks and blessed it, but they didn't eat the salmon. They just ate the, 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 um, the potatoes. You know, there was, it was something about they both needed to eat the salmon, but they just ate the potato. Joyce loved those types of images. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's both, it was both impoverished and extravagant at the same time, maybe. <laughs> well, that, that's, yeah, and that's luxury in some respects, isn't it? Impoverished and extravagant. Yeah. Um, because I said the, the notion of magnificence, which I did allude to, uh, is, and again, is, in a sense, is the way that the, Public buildings are magnificent, but also clothing is, mm -hmm. and, and a magnificence functions as a symbol in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, the example I gave of Holbein's poetry, portrait of Henry VIII, or the ones of Elizabeth I in particular, even you know, um, are simply not they're not portraits in the sense of this is the person, this is the icon, 
uh, mm -hmm. and what they're doing is demonstrating the uh, uh, importance of the symbolic head, which of course in English Reformation terms is very important because they're also trying to capitalize upon religious imagery at the same time, because they've, re they've replaced the sort of Catholic one with their own version uh, and they need a replacement. So it, it gets devolved onto the figure of the monarch in many ways uh, to do yeah. that. Could I pose a question to you about uh, what I think is the heart of your research? It concerns uh, the role of trade and commerce, right? To uh, to transform luxury from being a vice to the enlightenment uh, virtue, if you will. And um, you speak about Hobbes, but in that tra transition, it occurred to me there was the Protestant protectorate, you know, of uh, after the uh, the, the killing of, uh, of regicide of Charles the First in Whitehall. So Hobbes, of course, was you know uh, uh, the Leviathan was Cromwell, you know, and of course uh, Cromwell was a very sturdy and important stabilizing figure in English history, uh, not in Irish history. He was very <laughs> in English, we have a different take on Cromwell. Um, I'm Irish, and uh, so, but but the uh, with Leviathan, the uh, the shock I think um, to, to English history, they 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 brought back the king, and and you you speak about Mandeville, about Bernard Mandeville coming over from Holland, and uh, but he came during that. Augustan period with uh, the restoration of Charles II and uh, the restoration of, uh, of theater in, in, in England and of the arts and luxuries are suddenly available. And, uh, and so some of the satirical vein that he writes in the fable of the bees yeah, emerges from that worldview of a very, destabilized time with um, with um, with the, the the Protestant protectorate of Cromwell. Um, of course the 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 spokesman that is uh, not that that is not mentioned uh, is Milton. You know Milton, you know really that was probably the motivation for Paradise Lost, you know, is to think about what like Shakespeare with this idea of the fallen king um, and, and Lear, what do we do with this fallen world, this loss of a garden? Is England the Garden of Eden? Um, all those poets that, that came out afterwards, you know, were meditating on that and uh, even up until Blake. So go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the the focus that uh, in that on the on the, the, the trade stuff was because debates then focused upon um, in, in many ways, but there were partly economic debates. But the economic debates were, were very closely aligned to the moral debates, because one of the sort of views was that money spent on luxury was wasted money. What we should be doing it was in a sense is supporting home industry, for example, and not importing silks and finery and things from, from abroad because we were losing bullion. And then there was a big debate about, it got very technical in some respects about what interest rates were and what bullion would mean uh, and so on and so forth. And in so doing, people developed, and I talk about this in, in the book, uh, a different then notion of happiness becomes not the Aristotelian notion of happiness, it becomes in, in one level enjoyment uh, and what's wrong with enjoyment is the implicit subtext for that. Uh, and the fact that it produces what we would now call GDP. In other words, that the, and it comes in the 18th century more developed, that the poorest in society will be less poor because of industry. And industry will be motivated by luxury goods in part and also by international trade. And the effect of these, the, the utility of this, the utility of luxury in that sense, is it produces a better life 
in terms of the material of, our, of, the, four, of the four needs. In other words, people eat better, have better housing, warmer clothes, and have more opportunities to, in a sense, um, enjoy themselves. And all of these are pluses that come from casting off the negative disapproval um, that luxury in some sense is bad and wasteful. And it's that, that's, the, that's the transition period that I talk about. And from that, you get a different set of values, obviously, that comes about in terms of what, what's important uh, to, to societies. Yeah. Well, in, in some ways, the, uh, uh, that economic worldview is, with all of it, is, uh, you, if you were to compare uh, the world of Milton and, and that world that followed him, you'd say that uh, Milton was the last epic voice of England. Mm -hmm. That, you know, he began to really think of England, you know, as, a, as building the city, you know, the, the new Jerusalem. And then afterwards, those voices become economic voices and they're, they're shattered and uh, they're, they're they're imminent and material and and compelling. There are a lot of humus is uh, is very compelling. You know, is about trying to bring about the the material goods and and certainly it, it happened that there was all these uh, uh, that that industrial society happened in England and uh, I guess France as well. But England first, right? And uh, um, the urbanization of England happened first. And m maybe that's an important thing is to see from that point of where th of the 18th century England, what what happened? You know, what what uh, um, what in, what ensued from it? You know, that uh, uh, urbanization certainly is so is if, if you think about the uh, goals of the enlightenment is that we're gonna be all one world. And so trade certainly has that. It's, it's not epic like before, like Milton, but one world, okay. And, um, and then the world also has become uh, urbanized, right? The, I think 2004 was the time when the or more half the world's population for the first time became urbanized. Um, uh, I guess, you know, with, uh, and with urbanization is part of the underlying dialogue about luxury, right? You know, yeah, the, I mean, there, there is a, um, one of the laments of the tax on luxury in the 18th century is worries about that. The, 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 the poem by Goldsmith, Deserted Village, yeah, which is precisely the fact that we were losing these uh, bucolic but virtuous lifestyles, and people are flocking into cities and getting corrupted uh, by flesh pots and drugs and the whole Garthian image yeah. that you get of uh, of London. Uh, in all one sense, are the regs, how of progress, the regs progress are all, in a sense, uh, illustrations literally <laughs> are, are wrong when you've got a lack of a traditional moral code. And mm -hmm. villages were meant because they were smaller communities, you had a lot of self-policing went on, often, mm -hmm. often very repressive. So in the Scots case, that was, that mm -hmm. was, was the uh, Presbyterian Church in Scotland was notorious in the sense for, um, for keeping the, the uh, congregation, should we say, under very strict controls uh, and re re reproving all you know, uh, enjoyment in the sort of standard Calvinist way. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's a reaction against uh, that luxury was the for attack for that, but then look, the people came along and said, look, this is better. This is just gonna be a better life than you could live buying a field all day long. Gentlemen, I just wanted to interject and say we're into our last 15 minutes. Um, and I noticed there's, a, I know people in the audience would probably like me to pose this question. So I was wondering if I could just do that. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about desire um, and the role of desire in the idea of luxury. 
um, particularly from maybe a, an emotional condition and a response to it, but also uh, as a spiritual and perhaps evolutionary mechanism. Well, I'll, I'll start because I talk a lot about desire. Um, well, desire, in a sense, is, is partly, as I said, a, a, an epistemic philosophical argument. We use the word colloquially, and this is true of all uh, European languages I'm familiar with, that needs and wants can be used interchangeably. But in a sense, you can, there's a semantic difference between them, and I illustrated, I'll uh, mention in the talk this afternoon. Um, so desires are, in a sense, true of us as things that we know we want. Um, the, the, they are, they are in, intentionalistic. Uh, you, know, you know you want something but you don't know you need something. There is that epistemic difference. Now, how that bears out is, is for me anyway, in a sense, it give, gives you a dynamic because luxury will, will change uh, as people's desires change and desires can be amendable um, by definition. Uh, example I give in the book is uh, you might want a pint of beer, um, but then you see it's flat, or then you see there's some cider, then you remember you're, you're having a, you know, a dry January, so you don't drink the desire. So the desire is, is amendable in that way. So luxuries are always amendable with desires. Now the whole de debate about desire, which I, I, I confessed I didn't go into, um, there, 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 there are black boxes as far as I'm concerned, that, that desires are, are things that um, people could want. Now, we all know that societies exist um, partly to facilitate desires and partly to police desires. Uh, and that, that's always a, a balancing act. Cromwell's policing of desires, as it were, were rather different than Charles II's uh, English king's policing of desires. Uh, and that's partly what, what's going on in, in, in society's point of view. So I haven't got a view as to what um, the end or object of, a, of desire is. In luxuries, I say it's linked crudely speaking, to bodily satisfaction is derived from the four needs. Uh, but you can have desires, and I think Andrew was pointing this out, extend the notion of leisure, to say this includes uh, not materialistic goods, but also uh, non-materialistic goods, as contemporary literature and luxury now talks increasingly about, it was an experience. Luxury is an experience, um, not simply a, a Rolex watch. Uh, it's an experience of some sort or other. Uh, therefore, desires are, are sort of fluid and elastic. Um, I haven't got, a, in a sense, a, a view that desires have an end in that sense. They have the end that's determined by the desirer. Uh, and some ends are innocent and some ends are not innocent. Um, the person wants to rob you of your Rolex watch. It's not got an innocent desire, but it's got a desire uh, to do it. Thank you, Chris. Andrew, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I wonder if I could in also, the, there was a question from Peter de Kock about uh, Mum de Cher, and I think this is pertinent to the, to the question of desires, about thoughts of, of luxury, of worship. Um, sometimes it's, it's hard for us to you know, expand our scope of thinking about, you know, this is my personal desire and, but worship is also deals with collective desire or collective, you know, it's a, uh, the word liturgy means the work of worship. And so uh, when we go into the church, um, there's work involved. And so for our own church after uh, Vatican II in, in the Catholic church in, in the United States, we had, uh, well, we wanted to change things around. And so, so many things were done so quickly and so cheaply that it was uh, deeply unnerving to people to see, you know, that's the church that my father and grandfather sacrificed for uh, so much. But we began to think that we wanted to give people, uh, they, you know, basic necessities. And we focused a lot on the works of charity and, uh, but I do feel that now I, I'm in a, a poor parish, if you will, it's an old one in New York, um, but the, uh, 
uh, we're just installing even today a uh, little bronze artwork made in London uh, by with, with Chris Knight. And um, the work of making something beautiful is uh, extremely central to the lives of the poor. Um, both the elderly, more understandably, but also the young. Um, that's, you know, why should you, there was, we just recently made a chasuble, but it was a, a very poor woman who had saved for a long time this uh, jacquard, you know, a beautiful golden jacquard that she, she said, can we make it into a chasuble that I wear in the, so um, it was, it was beautiful. And, and of course it, you know, she didn't benefit from it directly other than the fact that she knows that it's being worn for everyone's benefit. And that seems to be uh, very important uh, for people as to the shared uh, desire. Um, you wonder, of, of course, the problem of the word desire is it, it's closely linked to, uh, or is it love? You know, like when we say that we love something to, um, uh, you know, that there are some things that like Cupid's arrows, one's lead and one's golden. Some things, some people just are enamored by something and others repulsed by it. Um, so the instability of human desires is something that is only moderated through ways in which people are collected together. Um, and there's actually very few venues now for people to be uh, collected, you know, mostly, and the, to me, to my mind, actually, that makes the, maybe the one real luxury of worship is that people can really be together that not, are not just from a very limited society but are from the wider and unpredictable communion of human beings, so. I mean, there's a link between, uh, if I could just inter what of that was thinking of then in a sense about not being individual, like sporting arenas, for example, um, mm -hmm. you desire that your team does well. Right. Um, and part of that is because you're not alone in that. There is a, a, a group of supporters and part of who you are, for some people, is identified by the fact I'm a supporter of New York Yankees or uh, Tottenham Hotspur or, or whatever. Uh, and that, in a sense, as I said in my remarks, clues into the notion of identity. Um, and that if you feel very fervent about something, um, then it becomes, in the way I analyze it, becomes a sort of subset in this personal necessity. But you become part of a bigger whole, and that's part, of course, is what the worship means in a way. That you you you've been sent. Don't lose yourself, but you you find a better self in, in, in ideal terms about yeah. who you are when you're with people of a like disposition. I, I love the song Jerusalem in England, which uh, it seems to trend. It's you know so, sung in rugby matches and football matches, yeah. and. Uh, but it, it, it's got patriotic fervor to it, but really it's, it's an intensely religious song. It is. That, uh, you know, deals with, uh, honestly, about the, the satanic mills, the yeah. legacy of the problem of industrialization. Yeah, so. there is an argument that when Blake write, writes that satanic mills, he means churches. He means, as it were, the official church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steady on, guys. Um, I think, I've, I think we have time probably just for one more question. Um, and I, I did want to bring in some, some ideas about the future, perhaps, of luxury. So if you don't mind me interjecting, I was just going to drop in this question, um, which is actually coming from one of our audience members. So with the present day idea of luxury being based on a business model, how will luxury evolve to be more inclusive and democratic in the future? So a question there about the future of luxury. Mm. Well, I, I could have a long answer to that, <laughs> um, which is to say that um, I, I, many ways I, I don't, well, the future of luxury look after itself. I, I haven't really got a, a crystal ball and I, I wouldn't pretend to have a crystal ball as to what the future is. I'm, I'm skeptical 
of the rather uh, loose use of words like democratization um, when it comes to luxury. It seems to me at best it's a façon de parler uh, that's to do with it. Uh, and it, it's, it's to do with versatile access and what are the barriers to access and what extent they are barriers, who is being excluded and who's not being excluded. Um, all these seem to me to be questions which uh, are sort of rather brushed under the carpet by saying, well, uh, let's make things called affordable luxuries or whatever. Uh, and the debate on the head of a pin is, are these really luxuries or not? Or is it true luxury, meta luxury or whatever it develops? So I'm, I'm slightly sort of, uh, let's say dyspeptic <laughs> uh, about that sort of language. And plus I, I eschew any uh, idea as to what the future of luxury is. I just don't know. And in many deep respects, I don't care. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Um, well, I, I'd say the, uh, um, uh, the business, the problem, I guess, of, of, of blending you know, uh, something that's uh, incalculable, incalculable and uh, sublime, uh, which, which luxury may point to about uh, human life is, um, is difficult from the point of view of a, of a business, you know, where you're, you're, if you're, the main motivation of course is to sustain your, your uh, to have a profit, you know, and uh, um, I don't think they're, uh, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think the the society is in the work of, you know, charity to businesses, or I, I think it's hard to to put it in, but I, you know, I. Um, I think, though, that the 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 role of the state needs to be uh, cultivated um, for, uh, uh, in particular, for crafts. You know, I think the big issue with with trade and commerce, which is even a present debate, is about what do you do about protectionism? Does it isn't isn't that really defeating the ultimate ro robustness of an economy? If you have, uh, you know, too much protectionism, um, you know the. Uh, uh, I, th I I I don't know, but I, I do think the uh, uh, the the problem of luxury and the and the world of crafts is an issue that needs to be addressed. That the, uh, you know, craftsmen are people that. Uh, they learn their crafts over a long period of time. There's something deeply mysterious about it. And there is both high culture and low culture and craft probably is part of low culture, even though it can go into high culture. Um, but crafts, the knowledge of crafts can be lost. And so uh, the, uh, it's the, the, maybe it's the education of the consumer or that's that's part of the mystery i'm just giving conjecture about it uh, i know that uh, uh professor manlo has spoken about uh, uh bernard uh, arnaud of uh, of louis vuitton and uh i'm i'm not up on all the uh, uh what is it hennessy louis vuitton but, but that they want to uh to change their own business model to be um, uh, one where they, they benefit art for art's sake. You know, those are uh, wonderfully French uh, ideals and they're probably suspect too because it's the, 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 the business model still needs to be maintained. I think this, uh, this debate or this talk actually is the basic title is about the virtue or uh, is is luxury a virtue or a vice and um, you know uh, I guess if I would say anything that, that luxury is an like, a, like an ur temptation as Dante 
puts it in the in the um, in the inferno before he even gets to any of the sins it's it's the one thing that kind of illusions about ourselves etc often defeat our ability to gain perspective and destiny so um pride and 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 chris has really been good about saying what's well, it's not only about luxury, there's other culprits out there, you know, like let's, uh, uh, the, you were saying about third world. So, um, uh, but, you know, I would say that the, uh, we do need to be honest about overcoming what really isn't a temptation. The vice of luxury is something that defeats the collective, work with the good. Um, the virtue of it, I think, also is to say, which is very deeply Christian, is, um, you know, it's, it's not just moderating your own desires, but it's also preparing yourself for a superabundance that God gives us in the incarnation. So, and somehow that's really important to cultivate hope for human beings with objects that are not just expensive, but resplendent with something deeply meaningful. Um, or even if it's, you said, it doesn't have to be the, the Michelin dinner, but, uh, but just a, a good dinner that sometimes people do gather around and enjoy. So, you know. Andrew, I'm going to have to um, stop you there, I'm afraid. We're, we're running over time. Uh, I want to give Chris just a, an opportunity just to make any final comments. Um, and I think the, the, uh, this idea of virtue we can bring up in the panel discussions coming up as well. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions around that area. So thank you very much, Andrew, for your comments um, and for taking part in this discussion today. It's been very illuminating and quite fascinating. I've learned a lot of things um, that are outside of my usual, you know, purveyance. Um, but Chris, do you have anything you'd like to just uh, add at the end there? Uh, you've, heard, you've heard too much of me already, I think, really. Uh, I want to thank Andrew for, for the conversation, which has been very interesting. And, and like all conversations, it, it takes you places you perhaps wouldn't think you're going to go. So I thank him for that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have the conversation. No, that was excellent. I, I didn't feel the need to jump in with too many questions because uh, I was fascinated by what you were discussing and it went in a direction I wasn't certainly would either. Um, I believe there might have been a few issues with our audience. So some people were, I think, unable to join us. So hopefully those technical issues are, uh, are, are, are being resolved as we speak. Uh, Sean, would you like to, to, to jump in now? Um, Sean or Veronica? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> um how are we doing good yes um well thank you both that was um as we expected an amazing and insightful talk and thanks to james for doing such a sterling job in um getting things moving and generating a really interesting conversation session two veronica or, or yes. panel one session two <laughs> Yes, we'll begin our panel on focused on production. We have Ken joining us. And uh, we have Ken, Federica, um, and um, um, sorry, we're just waiting for Simon to be um, added. Ah, there, Simon is there. Um, Are we ready? Is, uh, oh, Simon's sound is off, his video is on. Hi, Simon. Hello there, yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you for Just joining. Yeah. Um, so James is um, hopefully coming back to um, um, prompt Modern. us and push us on, push us along our road of, um, of production. I think the first instance is that we will um, start by introducing ourselves. Um, as I'm talking, I will introduce myself first. So my name is Sean Borstrock, and um, I'm interested in all things luxury. Uh, in Pursuit of Luxury has been um, a project that um, was started simply to generate some discussion, uh, varied discussions from all disciplines about what luxury ac actually means. And today, this afternoon, we're talking about, um, in this session, we're talking about producing luxury in all, in all its guises. Veronica. 
And I'm Veronica Manlow and happy to be working uh, alongside Sean and others with IPOL. I'm a teacher and professor at Brooklyn College in the School of Business and am doing research in luxury and right now, particularly in the area of production and artisans and uh, also looking at questions of branding as well. Ken? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Nimo. I am a researcher uh, with the University of Johannesburg uh, with an interest in luxury fashion as well, uh, with a specific focus on Africa. And I'm glad to join you guys. Erika? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Federica Perlotto. Uh, I'm a social anthropologist and I'm the course leader of the Art of Luxury program at Sotheby's Institute of Art. Um, I'm interested in luxury specifically, um, very recently on the digital uh, kind of uh, comments um, by the audience about luxury. Simon. Hello, everybody. I'm Simon O'Leary, and I'm a professor of uh, entrepreneurship at Regent's University London. Uh, and uh, I, I used to run the, um, we have a, an MA in luxury brand management. So I used to run that. And it was there I met Federica because Federica is also ex uh, Regent's University London. And uh, we collaborated on this work together. So uh, to give it a, um, well, to be honest, Federica did all the hard work and I just added a bit at the end, but there we are. <laughs> Great, thank you all very much. James, where should we start? Oh, hi everybody. Um, thanks for having me again. Uh, where should we start? Well, I figured um, if we're talking a little bit about production, why don't we start there? So I'd like to ask each of the panelists, what does the production of luxury mean to you specifically? Staying first. Veronica, you go first. <laughs> well, I think that there's certainly a paradox because as brands are expanding their reach, increasing their product lines, and also moving into areas where they can find lower cost labor, you know, at the same time, they're trying to, to retain that aura of exclusivity and to connect themselves and to keep connected to ideas of heritage and uh, quality, rarity. So I think to do that, they're developing new strategies, which the special issue of this journal really dealt with and all of the panelists have dealt with in their work on production. Thank you, Veronica. I can say something. Uh... Thank you, Simon. Yeah, so production, yeah, very important part of uh, luxury and luxury brands because um, obviously, uh, every organization wants to maintain its brand and any any uh, issues such as were just mentioned about um, skepticism, skepticism coming out about production areas or whatever. But also importantly, it's not just the product, is it? It's the quality of the service as well. So it, production doesn't affect everything uh, and it needs to be thought of in the round, both the product and the service, because um, particularly online now, uh, perception really is the key to all of this. Thank you, Simon. Kenneth, do you want to jump in there? Yes. Uh, I come in uh, from the perspective of what is happening on the continent. Um, we are all aware Africa as a cradle of uh, humanity has a special place in, in global history um, with um, its profound um, material culture in history of craftsmanship. It is quite uh, interesting uh, that the continent still isn't a major player uh, in terms of uh, the manufacturing and the production of luxury uh, for the global uh, consumer market. And, and that is where I come in. I, I am interested in investigating what really are the causes, what is driving this and how this can be reversed, how this continent can also participate in the global luxury economy. Um, I think that uh, when it comes um, about production, I think I can, I can also echo uh, Veronica and Simon, 
the question is how much the consumers and the audiences want to know about the production. How much are they prepared uh, to accept also uncomfortable realities and to question those? I think that that was uh, also a big, uh, a big questions um, that, well, Simon and myself, but I believe also Veronica, uh, <laughs> we were interested in. Um, I guess it's me. Um, I, I think I interpreted in a, in a slightly different way. You know, is the production the production of the myth that we subscribe to, or is production the production of the actual artifacts that we buy, or services that we buy? Um, and the, and in both of those instances, they're interchangeable. And I think, um, you know, the production could be seen as a method or a mode to get us to encourage or to get us to consume more stuff that we don't necessarily need. Thank you all. Um, does anyone want to jump in and, and add anything to that or shall we move on to another question? I think we can move to another question. Okay, great. Well, I mean, this one's for everyone again, but um, I, I suppose it's kind of pointed to Sean a little bit as well, because Sean, you've written quite a lot about um, how practices, um, so, uh, practices at certain firms such as Louis Vuitton and Prada seem to defy traditional definitions of luxury craftsmanship. So I just wanted you guys to maybe talk about craftsmanship and the role it plays with, within this notion of production of luxury. Um, and do you believe in a notion of true luxury and is this kind of connected to craftsmanship or is that just a mythology? Well, I think it's a mythology. I, um, especially, you know, in, in, in the world in which we live today, um, you know, craftsmanship is something very particular. And I think within luxury, um, you know, luxury is not defined by the amount of money you spend on a particular product. You know, it could be anything, it, it really could be anything. And it's a very personal thing. But we are sold luxury um, under the guise of things that appear to be better made or appear to have been made with better materials. Um, and the facade of, of, of luxury is what we see, whether it's on social media and advertising, um, the reality of, of the craftsmanship is often hidden. And one wonders why if these products, and I'm talking about, you know, you would um, refer to um, Prada, um, you know, if the products are in fact made in which, in the ways in which they are described, then why is that manufacturing process hidden? And it's typically hidden because they're not made like that. So where you see the Gucci adverts of men in white coats in this kind of smoke filled, amazing um, workshop, or even the Lindt chocolate man that pops up every Christmas kind of stirring chocolate and hand pouring it into a copper <laughs> basin. I mean, they, those, those, um, those scenarios are so far removed from reality that they are, you know, they're in effect non-existent. And I think where you do get craftsmanship, um, where you do get the um, person or the maker who has the touch of hand that impacts on the on the kind of the final um, artifact, I'm talking about physical things and not necessarily service, it, it, you know, that kind of, it, that contradicts the essence of what we are being described to buy those luxury conglomerates. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, in, in a nutshell. Um, so, you know, whether true luxury exists, I don't think it actually does. Um, and, you know, craftsmanship is an important factor that kind of defines what a, a luxury product may be, but, you know, it's, you know, we don't actually get those products that we, um, we're told we're getting. And I think also we can say that the luxury sector is so vast, so it encompasses, you know, artisans working in very small, you know, workshops, and there is certainly that, and then it ranges all the way up to the conglomerates where maybe production is really approaching, if not actually is within the mass market type of model. And so I think, um, and there's so many interesting kinds of things in between. I'm thinking of a woman that I interviewed for some research I'm doing uh, with Sean in an upcoming book. And she worked at Hermes as, a, as an artisan for many years. And then she founded her own small company in San Francisco. And so now she's doing, you know, using the expertise that she developed at Hermes 
which she feels is no longer a part of the of their practice because it's become a question of efficiency and a question of, of, of quantity, much more so than when she started out. But now she's employing and using those methods that she was trained in and she's training other artisans. So I think it's just such a big sector that we have to separate the industry from the craft of luxury. Yeah, well, I could echo, I would echo that because I think the way, it's interesting, we've talked, haven't we, earlier about 18th century England, and now we're talking about um, 21st century world of uh, COVID and Zoom. And it's, it, it, the world is, is different, but craftsmanship, certainly at the, at the beginning of that period, was the only way of having things made. There, there were no mega factories or, or things like that. Um, but I think maybe craftsmanship is maybe it could be redefined as the human touch. Is there a human touch in, in, in the making of this product or uh, is there a specialism um, involved? And certainly with um, the service elements of um, luxury, there's a lot of human touch involved in that and human activity. So uh, I, think th th I think there is a niche within craftsmanship, but the, uh, the, uh, the overall um, magnitude of the luxury sector. It, it can't all be like that now. It's very, very big. Thank you. Federica, would you like to come in on this? Yes, I think um, in the research we did, excellence was uh, basically the synonymum for luxury. So when talking about products, excellent is the top um, reply that uh, the online users use. Um, but then what does excellence mean? And I think that we're looking at the localization of production. So luxury companies, they localize in the production generally in cost effect effective countries pretty much. And so the questions that they were asking, uh, which is very compelling if you think about it, is that, okay, so if as a company, you're working in luxury and you strive to produce excellence. Now, can you explain why you're delocalizing your production in countries um, you know, that might have certain expertise, but certainly doesn't have you know, the expertise that you have in-house? Uh, so what's the justification of that? And this is where I think the trust of users, consumers kind of holds. Um, because there is no explanation for that unless, and that was quite interesting, I think, in our study, unless you are telling us that actually you are training, you are building a sort of hub of excellence under the umbrella of your brand, which poses another question. Um, can a luxury brand actually be the guarantor of excellence rather than, for instance, the place of production? interesting um kenneth can i ask you to jump in on this one yes i i find it rather interesting that the conversation around luxury is gravitating um more or less towards the handcrafted and uh, craftsmanship uh, in that wise we find that africa might necessarily be the oasis of the handcrafted of the handcrafted uh, possibly because we have not, you know, like reached the level of industrialization uh, that is seen in other parts of the world. And so uh, handcrafting is literally everywhere. You see it even by the roadside, you see it in the uh, artisans' workshops. In Ghana, where I'm from, you see people creating the most uh, intricate fabrics called the kente, uh, which is actually regal in nature. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, if luxury is realigning to the handcrafted, then indeed Africa can lead uh, the global luxury research basically. And in order for that to happen, I fear, I, 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 I see, and I, um, I think that we need to really look at the very definition of luxury. Uh, we, we really need to go back to the very concept of luxury decouple it from what we have now, like the commercial, uh, what do you call it, uh, nature and the state of luxury as we have it now. 
And that is the only way that, for example, we can have African brands fully participate in that. That is the only way we can have local brands um, put out there into the global economy what is truly African, what is truly handmade, what is imperfect, in, uh, what is unique, what is one of uh, a way that you know, like Africa itself can participate or contribute uh, profoundly to the global luxury economy. And I find it quite exciting, really exciting. That's, um, can I jump in? Sure. Uh, no, I think that's really interesting what Ken has just said, because I was thinking when he was talking, I was thinking about Indibele beading. You know, mm -hmm. that's the epitome of something that is crafted, you know, thousands or millions of these tiny little beads strung together in the most phenomenal patterns. Um, and that kind of, I, I think, um, reflects what Simon was saying about this idea of craftsmanship and the touch of hand because, you know, those two things kind of go together. And if we think about the um, um, early 17th um, or even the 18th centuries and, and um, you know, the production, as you may call it, even though it wasn't production in the way we understand production, um, it was very much then, as has been said about the touch of hand. And I think those are the things, you know, we can have millions of products, you know, Primark tights that are 99p that are luxury um, or a Sunseeker yacht that's, I don't know, 100 million pounds, that's a luxury. But, you know, kind of creating this definition is becoming increasingly important. But, and then again, we need to think about the hand because that is intrinsically what makes something special. It's not the machine. Yeah, and I think I can jump in a little bit um, from to back that up because um, when we looked at um, what people think about when they're talking online, we looked at thousands of posts and, and uh, commentaries about what people were saying about production and luxury. And uh, what comes out of it is that it, it, if there's not a good story as to why the production is 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 going on where it is, it's not a there's not an investment in the local community because Africa could well be a, a center of excellence for, for luxury products. Um, but the brands need a story to, to, to back that up and, and, and to sell it properly. Um, because if they don't, then uh, there's what we found and Federica will add to this as well, I'm sure. But uh, that if you don't, there's, you start to create three different groups of people. And the first one is a, a whole bunch of skeptics because you're not telling the story, you're not saying what's going on. Um, and so it just becomes what skepticism. And you, obviously no, no brand, no luxury brand would want that. Uh, a second group is they will, they'll, they'll embrace whatever's going on anyway. They will accommodate whatever they trust the brand and they'll accommodate and they'll, they'll find a way to accept it. So that group, uh, if you like, they're believers anyway, they'll, they'll believe it. Um, they already believe the, the brand. And then there's a third group that they'll, they'll see something's happening, and, but it, and it may redefine what they think luxury product purity means because it, it's, it's starting to um, make them think at least. So, you, so you've got those three groups, the accommodators who will accept it anyway. You've got the redefiners who may accept it. Uh, they'll think about it and then you've got the skeptics who really are in a in the danger zone so it's very important that brands particularly now that we're living online have these good stories and and real stories that people will believe because um uh, the world today uh, we interpret the the information and in the news from what we read and what we hear generally through social media a lot of it so it's very important to manage the situation, if you like. But Simon, are brands telling real stories or are we hearing stories that divert, let's say, an ever more um, demanding customer that wants more transparency, you know, diverting them away from the very questions that they might ask that could be problematic? Yeah, I mean, uh, and that's a good point because um, if, if it starts to feel simply as public relations it's a bit dangerous as well mm -hmm. so it has to be a real story in the end you might get away with it, um, uh, half a story for a while but not forever I guess there is a, an element um, 
which we found in the study, and that was the quest for transparency. And I was wondering about you know that term because um, there was one uh, blogger um, in the watch industry telling me uh, that secrecy is the enemy, secrecy is the killer. And I thought that uh, you know much of the literature about luxury is about the dream, the creation of the dream. And so I, I have the impression that companies have been using the dream. Um, some of them uh, maybe not willingly, but others uh, just to feed the dream, they felt authorized in a way to uh, work on secrecy, work on mystery. And this is where I think nowadays, as uh, uh, Simon and also Sean were saying, you know, we get access to information and actually we want to know uh, who these companies are. We check and the CEOs, the CCOs, we, in the past, you wouldn't know who they were. You would just know the name of the creative directors of fashion companies and that was it. And nowadays we can follow them on Twitter. We can understand who they are, what they do. And so, I think there is a quest for transparency that will force companies to find a new language. So as Simon was saying, you know, it's not anymore the marketing language. Uh, it's a new kind of language that can translate those values into, you know, a language that we all understand. I was just reading an Italian, philo um, an Italian sociologist actually uh, talking about the revenge of the truth which means people now want the truth. And I think it's also exacerbated by COVID. We want to know what's going on. And so I think it's a matter of luxury companies really find a new language and work on the concept of transparency. Yeah, I think that's, um, if, Ken, were you gonna say something? Yes, I, I wanted to uh, jump, jump in on that. Um, so marketing as important as it is, uh, seems to be the accurate heels of uh, luxury. Um, it is important that African brands, especially uh, those that want to play in the global landscape, uh, put in a lot of effort into telling the stories, into projecting uh, the craftsmanship associated with local brands. But the point is, then we are circling back into what has actually led uh, the global West into what we have now. We are, like um, Federica said, what, what is the truth? The stories that we are telling, how do consumers verify these stories? I mean, they can be created. We can create um, um, commercial, like literally build a commercial language that projects these brands as being ethical, being whatever that we, we want them to be. But at the end of the day, we could create the same monsters that are scaring us, you know, like uh, basically causing the whole world or the global luxury economy to shift to, to, to the conversation that we're having right now. So there is a dilemma there. Uh, and I believe that as these conversations unfold, we will, we will definitely know how local brands should have, uh, brands basically from those that are coming in from Africa, would, uh, what you call it, project themselves. So I'll take, for example, uh, Vision Westwood. In, in the campaign um, with the production that sourced them uh, from Africa. You see these stories being told, uh, some of them quite interesting. I remember there was this image of um, uh, her being in the slums with these uh, beautiful yet gaudy clothes. Uh, and it's telling a story, but the question is, um, what, who is the audience? Um, who inadvertently are the consumers? who are the beneficial in, 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 in truth and in reality. And all of these have to be put in proper context and perspective, um, you know, like in, in, in their voice. Would anyone else like to come in on the subject of branding and brand stories in relation to what we've been discussing? Okay, and I'll just say if the audience have any questions as well, feel free to type them in the Q&A and I will try and get around to them. Uh, as we move forward. Um, so I thought I had a, an interesting question here. It's in regards to the pandemic, really. Um, and I'll ask it to Federica first, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll highlight who should go next. 
So basically, now that the pandemic has deeply modified our ties with places, is its link with authenticity and luxury still holding its value? And I say over to you, Federica. Thank you. Um, of course, um, you know, again, we are talking about wars, right? And so we need to understand uh, what these words refer to. Um, I think that uh, the authenticity as it used to be, um, for instance, you know, the made in Italy luxury rather than the made in France, um, in a way, still stay up to a certain level. But I think that um, there is the quest to move towards how do you make things as a seal of authenticity. So I think there is a sort of disconnection with the place um, as such. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm referring back to what Simon was saying when we were profiling in a way the attitude of the audiences towards luxury production and the spirit of the place. Um, you know, some of them were actually saying, uh, look, there is a globalized uh, pipeline, there is a globalized supply chain, you know, um, I'm not expecting, you know, I don't believe and I'm not expecting actually that a made in Swiss watch will be 100% made in Switzerland. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I want excellence again. So they were going back to a sort of, uh, if you want, um, metaphysical understanding of authenticity, uh, which means what the brand stands for and how do you achieve through your production this excellence. So I see in terms of place, in terms of authenticity, um, you know, probably it still holds whenever we have a tangible evidence that Italy has, I don't know, uh, great production of leather goods. France has great production of textiles. So Switzerland has know-how in that. I mean, this is, you know, we cannot doubt that. But then authenticity, I think, will be more and more tied to the company and how the company does, how the company behaves. Thank you. Um, Simon, would you like to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, um, just to build on uh, Federica's points there, I mean, in a, uh, we all know the world is is smaller, effectively, than it was 100 years ago. Uh, uh, and um, everyone knows that, and, and they understand that things move around. Um, but I think what, what, what consumers are looking for is that, that the brand is investing in quality, that they're... That they're they, they may be producing elsewhere or they may be um, uh, offshoring it to some extent, but that they're investing, that, it, that the quality is maintained both in terms of the production and also in terms of the research and development uh, and also in terms of the training and development of their own people and the local people. So I think that every, every, everyone pretty much will accept a movement. I mean, there still are specialisms, of course, uh, France will, will be known for wine for many years and, and Italy will be known for its leather and its glassware for many years. But, but everyone accepts that, that there's also other centers of excellence around the world now as well. And um, I think if, if the stories are believable and, and there's, a, there's a tangible um, note that investments are being made and, and investing for the future and not just not just transferring production for economies of scale, then there, there, then there is a story to tell. Thank you very much. Um, Veronica, do you want to jump in here? Well, I think, you know, because of the pandemic, I mean, luxury was certainly at a standstill, right? I mean, in terms of um, if we think about um, if we think about the supply chain, right, came to a total halt. And then there was the question of what to do with excess merchandise that was piling up. And so I think every brand to an extent has had to sort of reinvent itself and think of worst case scenarios. And, you know, the consumer has changed. And I think that questions that, um, you know, Chris and Andrew were discussing, consumers are thinking about these things. Maybe they're not thinking about it in the same depth, of course, but the questions raised, I think, are coming to mind and people are questioning 
you know, is it is it just, is it moral, is it, does it make sense in this climate, even, even economically, to invest in something that is not necessary? And, ha and when we are brought, you know, it's brought to our attention more so in the public consciousness about inequality and racism, I think all of these things are in the public consciousness right now. And so people are questioning, how do I move forward? And I think brands are also faced with that question. And so how will they respond? I mean, there are various ways that they might respond, but um, it's, a, it's a very uh, fearful time for them because, you know, their consumers are, are rethinking and reconsidering what they are going to do with their purchase power. I, I don't agree if I'm jumping in. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, Sean's the one who's told me I have to call people by name, and here he is jumping and breaking his own. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't agree. Um, I think that the luxury, you know, that the luxury brand, and I'm not talking about luxury, I'm talking about these conglomerates have not been hit for, um, terribly by the financial, by the pandemic. They've continued to produce stuff. Um, they shifting the seasons around. So things that might not have been sold in fall are now sold in summer. Um, they've seen an increase um, in the um, purchase of their goods, despite all the issues around this pandemic. Watch watches um, have seen an increase of about 40% in their sales in China alone over the past six months. Um, and I think, you know, people with money have made more money out of the pandemic um, because that is the business they're in. You know, if you think about Jeff Bezos and um, Amazon, you know, his wealth hasn't diminished. <laughs> it's certainly quad probably quadrupled. So I think that, um, you know, luxury is, you know, at that level, and they, it's not luxury, it's fashion. At that level, fashion is going to um, be relatively unscathed. Um, and we'll see, you know, how many Chanel stores have closed? None. How many Louis Vuitton stores have closed? None. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that um, we're going to see such a, um, we're going to see a problem with um, any of the kind of luxury brands moving forward. Perhaps it's some of the independent brands that are going to get hit hit the most and some of those more artisanal. Just talking from a New York perspective, I'm um, going down Fifth Avenue. There's quite a lot of boarded up shops, but it, it isn't Hermes, it isn't Chanel. You know, it, it, it tends to be those uh, those more independent retail outlets. Um, so that's I mean, obviously, that's a concern, I'd say. No, I think, and I think you, James, you're absolutely right. It's the smaller businesses that are going to be impacted. But when you think about luxury, and this, I suppose there's a reference to what Simon was saying earlier, when you think about luxury, people don't think about, um, you know, the, the smaller companies who are in a workshop um, making um, these amazing things. You know, th people think about Prada and Gucci and Louis Vuitton um, and, and don't really think about... Um, you know, where something might be made, who's making it. Uh, Veronica and I have kind of had um, fortunate or unfortunate access to some information that Veronica has done research on about these laborers in Texas making Louis Vuitton bags. And it's horrific. So I think you're absolutely right that it's about place um, and it's about the maker. And I think those, you know, those makers, unfortunately, um, you know, they, are slightly pushed by the wayside because either people are, can't get out or they don't have the facility or the um, access to be able to, I don't know, offer the same service that the, the kind of big, you know, suppliers do. It, that's that, And that's, I think that's all over the world where you're seeing those smaller makers being impacted um, much more than the bigger brands. And Sean, you've written about this con this uh, topic recently in the conversation, and certainly, as you say, the larger conglo you know, the conglomerates obviously are, are thriving, mm -hmm. and have other kind you know are, have their um, you know have their hands in various kinds of sectors. So it's not, they're not if something is is um, being challenged, then they always have other things to kind of buoy them. So yes, the smaller brands. But I think there is still, and I don't know how others feel about this, I think, and I'm not sure how important it is, but there is certainly a kind of question, I think, in the mind of, of the consumer, right, about how do we go forward, because this pandemic has brought about that kind of um, need to really question. So whether that'll be significant or 
passing. I mean, of course, the luxury analysts feel that we are going to really be back on track and that this is going to be just sort of a little, you know, blip along the way. But I think that is an interesting question. Is, the, is there a change of consciousness or is it going to be business as usual? What I, what I, what I would say, just to complement that, is it is true the smaller companies have got much larger pressures because it affects them very quickly. The one thing that has changed in the world, of course, is access to social media and, and the creation of stories. And I think uh, now there is an opportunity for the smaller, smaller brands, the niches, who really have got the quality to get their stories out. Um, but it does, of course, require that they produce stories and, and spend time uh, doing so, um, which, of course, is an investment itself. So, uh, it, it, and that's a tricky balance. But I think at the moment, it, the, those new brands establish themselves very quickly um, or have the capability to establish themselves much more quick today than they did 30 years ago because of social media. Can I ask, may I ask a question, James? Um, sure, but I do want to give, uh, okay. do want to give Kenneth an opportunity. <laughs> to, you know, just bear me one second, Sean. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth, would you like to jump in here? We haven't forgotten about you, I promise. Yes, <laughs> yes uh, most definitely. I do agree with um, both Veronica, Sean, and Simon at the same time. Um, if anything, uh, the, the pandemic has indeed deepened the, the, the chasm between um, the larger conglomerates and the smaller independent brands. And indeed a lot of the small brands have been pushed to the very brink of uh, what you call it, uh, uh, destruction or closure. Uh, it's, the heat has actually been felt in, in South Africa as well. I mean, uh, being forced to close your stores to your clients is, is, is not easy. And a lot of local brands have bogged under, under, under the pressure. But what is also interesting is, um, just like uh, Simon said, it's given a lot of opportunities to local brands or small independent brands to also put their best foot forward. Uh, people are attentive and online. Uh, they might not be buying, they might not be uh, investing in the pieces that they used to, but the good news is they are attentive. There is, there is an audience, uh, to, to alternative stories, to alternative views, uh, they're beginning to look at a whole lot of issues. I mean, like, uh, just like Veronica said, um, consumers are becoming more, more and more uh, discretional. They're asking a lot of questions. I mean, like the issue of ethics is coming in, the issue of diversity, inclusivity, and all of these things are coming in. And a lot of people are asking themselves, well, do I even need this in the first place? What's the provenance of this very specific product? And this is the point where small independent brands, those with transparent supply chain, um, brands that are really doing the right thing, uh, have an opportunity to sell the story. Literally, the COVID has is, is leveled the playing field. Um, in South Africa, there's something quite interesting uh, that's happening. In the, in the, in the short span of uh, probably the first and second quarters of this year, we saw some of the prominent brands, local brands, Laduma, uh, a brand called uh, uh, Makosa by Laduma, opened two stores in a, in, a, in, a, in a space of, I think, like three months. Opened one at the V&A Waterfront uh, Mall. And then there is also another one, uh, this collective known as Africa Rise also literally opening three stores. And this has been in the heat of the pandemic. So the question is, um, as much as the pandemic has impacted a lot of, uh, of brands, especially even the smaller ones, it's also created opportunities, uh, organic opportunities for these brands to, to grow also their footprint as well and to represent, represent themselves to the, to the global consumer. Thank you. Um, I've just had a question in from the audience, which I think might be interesting for us to add on to this particular discussion. So uh, it's from Stephen Adams, who says the panel talks instructively about production, but he's wondering what thoughts you may have about the networks of exchange, because for him, it is here um, where value is created. Uh, 
And uh, Veronica, would you like to come in on that one? So by the networks of exchange, are we looking at all of the different networks? I mean, taking into account the consumer, taking into account... Um, that, that was my, that's my take on it. Um, Stephen, if you want to drop in anything else, if that's, if I've got your question the wrong way around, then do let me know. Um, but yeah, that, that was, that's my take on it from the question that's posed. Okay. Well, I mean, I think just like um, Federica and Simon were saying from their research in terms of social media, that there is this kind of co-creation, right? And it's not just about the brands deciding on a particular path and moving forward, but they're going to be questioned. They're going to be challenged. Um, so there is a new dialogue, I think, that's opening up. And so, I mean, whether we think about the supply chain and all of its networks, or we think about the consumer, there are so many more facets that really become part of the equation that I think, depending on, on the question that we're looking at, uh, it's, not just an, it's not just a very straight path. It's a kind of um, collaborative one, whether by choice or by, or by design. Thank you, Veronica. Federica, would you like to jump in on that question too? Uh, yes, I interpret then the network again as uh, as the consumer uh, perspective, and I I can just echo Veronica in saying that um, you know uh, the social media has empowered uh, consumers to have their own independent voice, and that was something that companies weren't used to in the sense that the communication and the creation of value in that moment was guaranteed by marketing. And so we would get access through magazines or even, you know, if, or if we could purchase items, but that was it. We couldn't feedback any sort of community about our purchase, whether we liked it or not and so on. And nowadays we have, with social media, we have an independent voice and the value that you create is not anymore the value attached to the product is also the value that people see in what you do and this is a value that i i think companies in general not only luxury companies uh, i don't think they were expecting to face so i i agree with veronica i think that companies really need to uh, kind of come to terms on the fact that they're not just producing value but consumers, audiences are producing values and they're producing their values. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you go with that? That's a big question uh, for me. Thank you, Federica. Uh, Sean, would you like to weigh in on this? Sure, I'm, keeping, I'm trying to keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, this network, uh, um, if I've got Stephen's um, question kind of correct, I think the network of exchange in production is really, really important. Um, because, you know, create kind of luxury doesn't exist in, in, um, in isolation of everything. And the, the greatest things come out of collaboration um, and um, diverse collaboration. So I think if there were opportunities for um, a net uh, kind of a production network of exchange that was, um, more open as opposed to um, sewing a label in France that says made in France when something's been made in um, Bulgaria, I won't mention any brands. Um, but, you know, if you can, you know, if you can do that, so I don't know, go to South Africa and um, work with, um, oh, I don't know, beaders or go to Ghana, work with the weavers of the kente cloth or go to, I don't know, North America and work with um, whoever or wherever. I think that kind of net network, um, which is an exchange not only of kind of skill, but of knowledge, um, is something that it would be a, an amazing opportunity for, for luxury brands, because then you're addressing many issues. Veronica referred to, you know, issues of um, kind of inequality and, you know, creating something where people are coming together to do something um, would, you know, at least start to kind of break down barriers, create collaborative um, opportunities, and it will be a much more open process, which is what Federica's referred to. You know, it's important. I think those sorts of things are important. And because the world is a closer, you know, uh, everything's much more closer in the world, these things are possible. I mean, maybe not now, but, you know, um, 
hopefully when things open up, these things will be possible. And hopefully um, I've kind of interpreted, partly interpreted what Stephen was asking. Maybe Stephen's question might be about the circular economy. It may be actually what he's getting at. Sure. Stephen, you've um, raised many questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a point as well, James. Uh, I think it's a very good question, the networks of exchange, because not that long ago, really, it was almost monodirectional, wasn't it? You know, that you'd contact someone else, they'd contact you, and nobody else knew anything about it. But now there's connections. It's a whole cobweb now. It's a cobweb of networks now. And, uh, and, and of course, managing a cobweb is very different to managing a, a couple of straight lines. So uh, the, you know, there's links between consumers, producers, investors, suppliers, competitors, uh, in, uh, it, the, it's, it's a huge network now and, and, and it can only grow bigger. So I think managing that network is very important. And when, particularly in luxury, reputation is critical. Uh, it's, even, it's even more critical that, that luxury brands do it as well as possible. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Kenneth, do you want to uh, add anything to this conversation? Yes, most, most definitely. Um, uh, collaborations and uh, these networks um, definitely speak to the issue, once again, of inclusivity. Uh, it is um, really important that um, brands, if, 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 if they require or if they are properly projected or placed in the global marketplace, um, do have the, the, the proper linkages um, uh, to the global network. I mean, I have seen very interesting things play out. Uh, for example, there is the, uh, what you call it, um, the recent, uh, the Louis Vuitton Prize, for example, that recently um, recognized designer, the local designer, Fabi um, and in, in the process placed them in the, in, in the global spotlight. But it is more important there is the essence, and there's a need to go beyond that, um, not just place these in the global art spotlight, but also um, empower these designers, empower these brands to be able to tap into uh, not just the network of these uh, established conglomerates like the Louis Vuitton and the like, but creating platforms that uh, enable them to, to reach a wider audience beyond what they're able to in the local economy. So just to let you know, guys, we've come up to uh, half past the hour. So technically, um, this session should be over, but we did start about 10 minutes late. So maybe I could just ask one, uh, one final question to this panel. Um, but can I ask you to keep your, your answers re relatively brief so that we don't hold up for a session of the rest of the day? Um, so basically, what are your thoughts on the production of the idea of luxury through architecture or interior design for, for locations such as like stores and retail outlets? Um, and perhaps more specifically, how about the idea of commissioning famous architects or, or famous designers to try to you know, create that illusion or that production of the idea of luxury? Um, Veronica, would you like to start with? Well, luxury has long drawn uh, cultural and social and economic capital from the association with art. And we see, um, and the next panel is going to address this very directly, and we see this with these um, not only magnificent flagship stores, but with the digital realm. And certainly I think a lot of it is about um, creating a kind of escape from the, and, and a disconnect from the commercial sphere. I think that's really at the heart of what this is about. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Sean, would you like to jump in? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um... Well, I mean, you know, obviously architecture is really important um, in terms of um, attracting, you know, in terms of well, within the luxury, um, within the luxury context, it's important to um, kind of gener kind of create these, um, I don't know, cathedrals of consumption, if you may. And whether or not it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's important in a business sense. I think, and it's important in a, um, um, in a social sense. 
luxury is kind of increasingly becoming less about the product, more about an experience. It's kind of what you get when you go to the store. So having these kind of amazing, famous architects um, kind of design these amazing flagship stores, you know, is one way of attracting custom. But Silvio and Peter are better to kind of answer this than I am. I mean, Sylvia and I went to um, Seoul a couple of years ago and kind of, I think we're slightly, um, I don't know if, I, if this is correct, uh, but dumbfounded by the kind of architectural brilliance um, of some of those stores that you see nowhere else in the world. Well, maybe in, you know, Tokyo a bit, but you don't really see them in New York. You don't see them in London, Milan, Paris, really, um, because they are confined by space and, you know, space generally. Um, and I think, you know, those stores, you know, there are amazing spaces, there are amazing places. But, you know, I, I mean, this is a personal thing. I'm not, you know, I don't know really what they kind of what they add to the world. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm slightly more cynical than everybody else about the whole luxury thing, because, you know, to me, you know, they do things just to make money. <laughs> <That's their point. laughs> uh, Federica, would you join the, join the conversation? Yes, I'm leaving the commercial side. I think Sean has expressed <laughs> pretty much about it. Um, I'm just thinking about these spaces from a sociological perspective. And I, I'm also referring back to what Father Andrew and Chris were saying before about cathedrals. Um, I think that, you know, in, in our lives, um, those kind of physical uh, buildings are a little bit like cathedrals in a way. Not maybe, well, as I said, let's set aside consumption, but basically we need a center where we can spend time. We need a center, we need a center, we need a place where we can think about, wow, you know, about something that astonishes us, something that, you know, creates wonders in our lives. And in the past, I would say in Europe, at least you would have the square where you could meet people, you could have uh, the church. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this is pretty much expressive of our societies where we don't have probably that points of reference so strong. And so we are looking for places where we can hang around, post it on our Instagram, and this is our reality. Thank you, Federica. Uh, Simon, can I ask for your opinion on that? Well, I think there is certainly a place for um, quality architecture or design in, in, in luxury, whether it's the small artisan um, facility or, 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 or the, or they're a much larger place because, uh, as we've discussed, a, a, a lot of um, luxury is about image. It's about image. It's about perception. It's about showing that you're a niche, showing that you're bespoke. Um, what I would say, though, is you could have a great design. I think once you go through the doors, it needs to continue. I think once you go through the doors and, and the, what you experience um, needs to match up with what you've seen and... and and what you, what it's created in your mind as you approach the building. Yes, I agree with that. That's a very interesting point. Um, Kenneth, can I just get your ten cents on this? Yes, definitely. So, um, definitely from the, the the perspective of the African luxury economy, um, retail footprint in Africa has actually been one of the banal uh, has has been quite banal to. Uh, the operations of a lot of local brands. Uh, with this question that you talk about, the collaborations between um, architecture, art, and fashion, what immediately comes to my mind is the collaboration between David Ajayi, uh, Sir David Ajayi, and Alara uh, Lagos. Um, uh, this conceptual retail space that is actually making waves um, around, around the world. I find it quite interesting. This is a space that is literally a fusion of uh, not just fashion, but art, music, and actually lifestyle, presenting the very best of uh, what Africa has to offer. I also find this as interesting because it becomes um, a catalyst uh, of, of, of Africa's cultural renaissance. This is a space that is able to project um, the best of what we're able to offer. Uh, for far too long, uh, 
uh, Main Street and High Street have been the the the, the, the artisans on the street on the, on the street corner. But this is an opportunity to present our very best art or our very best art stuff in, in the most conducive in the most beautiful space. And I find it very refreshing. I believe that more of such would actually push uh, Africa's agenda to, to be relevant in the global economy. Thank you. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of this panel, or all, all we've got time for. Um, I, we could go on all day. It's very, very interesting. And I've got a few questions coming in from the audience as well, which we will endeavour to get to during the Q&A session after the following um, panel. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all of my panellists for taking part in this lively discussion today. Also, I just want to thank you all for part um, of Intellect's special themed issue um, focusing on the subject. So thanks all for that. Um, and we're looking forward to... Um, to, to, to being able to present more and more luxury studies through the forthcoming IPOL journal as well. So yeah, thanks, thanks all on behalf of Intellect as well as myself. My understanding of space of luxury is very similar to what we were discussing just before the break, which is really about the space intended as a container. So the, 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 the place, if you like, where things around luxury are happening. So that obviously involves the physical space as well as the digital space and the virtual space. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, over to you. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the architecture, but I'm more interested in how we pursue luxury. So as an analogy, um, those 16th and 17th century ships who went over to get sugar and, and uh, ginger and that sort of stuff, um, it, it was as much to me, in my understanding of it, uh, about um, about the pursuit, about um, being able to reach out for something but not being able to get it. So if we were able to um, produce sugar and, and ginger in our backyard, it wouldn't have that value that it that had about um, getting on the cutty sock or getting on something and heading off into the into the distance uh, and the distance is mentally as much as what it is physically. So the value or the luxury about that whole journey was actually, you know, um, seeded in your mind and it, it grew over time. And I think um, <clears throat> that's an important aspect that we shouldn't lose. Um, I know, you know, I, I could go on about the physical and, um, and the visual side of things, but in, in the sense then that visual is just as much import, as important as, as the physical side of, of our understanding of luxury. Thank you, Peter. Um, Sheena, can I get you to jump in on this question? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have an unusual relationship to luxury. I've never knowingly purchased a luxury item. I'm sure I have accidentally, but I have literally no interest in luxury brands whatsoever. And Sean knows this about me. We've known each other a long time. Um, what I am interested in, though, is what um, Chris and um, Father Andrew were talking about, which is the way that um, meditating on luxury can kind of give us a sense of, um, you know, kind of political space, ethical space. And in the same respect that um, a very good writer called Margaret Bowden, who writes about um, artificial intelligence, made the remark that we don't have artificial intelligence right now, but the very fact that we want it and the kind of questions that it raises really bring back big philosophical questions about you know, what it is to be intelligent, to have cognition, et cetera. So it's more about the questions for me. And so the space for me is more about the conceptual political, ethical space, and also the linguistic space. So I'm not particularly interested in luxury brands per se. So I'm, I'm literally, I'm just putting that on the table. So um, yeah, that's where I'm coming in, in a very odd space there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and, and Mark, can I get a few words from you too, please? Sure, yeah, I suppose, um, similarly to Sheena and also with Peter, where um, it's more of an uh, ethereal sort of sensation um, or a drive or a desire. And I think one of the things that ideally I suppose I look for is authenticity um, and about what creates that authentic um, experience. Um, and it can come from a number of different areas and it's not necessarily something that comes through um, the luxury brands as such um, or luxury product, um, but it's more about how you get yourself into that state of mind and the choices and the philosophical sort of choices and decisions um, that you may make um, in order to discover 
what that means for you, um, which I suppose harks back to this whole idea of, um, of luxury as being uh, originally something which was uh, discovered. Um, and I think now with our always on and connected sort of mentalities and access to information, um, it's becoming very difficult to, um, um, I suppose, maintain that sort of critical um, <laughs> sort of distance from something which is always accessible. Uh, we can have anything we want. Um, so it's kind of looking at how we can redefine luxury with that kind of backdrop. Thank you very much. Um, talking about redefining luxury, I kind of wanted to get into slightly into the geopolitics of luxury. It's been a pretty tumultuous five years and 2020 has certainly been uh, no, no change there. So how do you feel that things, uh, you know, how, geo, geopolitically speaking, have, have a, is, how is luxury changing from that perspective? Um, and Silvio, if I can ask you that question. Yeah, that's a very interesting one. Obviously, since the, I suppose, the early 90s, when we all start talking about globalization and all this, um, I think uh, we kind of embarked on a kind of journey that um, take us to where we are today in terms of the the touch. I think somebody in the previous panel mentioned this, the, I suppose, the detachment from physical space or the decentralization of, of space. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that, um, you know, some, you might be in a store in New York, but you have similar things that are happening around you in terms of luxury and identity and visual communication that happen in the other, you know, on the other side of the world. So, um, in terms of um, Again, there is this, and I think we are, we, you might argue that we are the cusp of it, of, of the situation where um, we, in a way, everything that, um, well, again, everything that used to be very peculiar about certain place and space uh, in terms of, again, uh, craft, you know, for instance, somebody mentioned the Italian little, uh, you know, um, bottegas, you know, the, the, the the little shops where you can actually go there and buy some kind of handmade shoes or stuff like that. That it's, it's, you know, Sean might have some completely different take on this, but I think my perception of that is disappearing in that, in that it's not just a unique experience you can get when you go to Florence there, you know, it's something that you can find possibly online, you can find in some other place. So um, in terms of, um, you know, uniqueness, I think is disappearing. So for me, it's, it's especially with the kind of digital you know, um, experience that we all have um, is becoming something that is ubiquitous. Does it does it address your point or? Yeah, so I think yeah, I think that's yeah. That's, it's raised some interesting comments there. Thank you, um, Peter. Can I get your uh, take on this? Uh, yeah, well, Sylvia and I have got this saying that we're going from gold to golden, um, and luxury is becoming more and more a bit like an escape hatch. You know, we. Um, we're trying to get away from the ordinary, especially with this sort of lockdown. Um, we're trying to get away from these states of homogenization that the lender likes to talk about. Um, so it, the problem with going into this golden state where we, we dependent on our senses, uh, especially through um, technology, is the idea of um, understanding what it is processing that sense data to the point that we trust that kind of information. And uh, I think that's gonna be the biggest uh, challenge ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Sheena, can I get you to jump in on that one too? James, can you can you repeat the question again? I, I've sort of slightly forgotten what you were asking. Yeah, sure, sure. Basically, it was relating to how the geopolitics of luxury changed, especially in light of the last sort of five years, which I think we can all agree have been rather tumultuous politically and with the pandemic. Um, and then, of course, with a lot of civil unrest taking place around the world as well. So I just wanted to know how you feel that like that that's affecting luxury. Well, I don't work within luxury. As I say, I'm an academic and an artist and a philosopher. So that's not my, no, I know I can't speak about the actual geopolitical ramifications, you know, for, for luxury as a, as a market, if you like. 
But what I can say is, is you know, from my, my own view is, um, you know, I'm just curious, uh, but I was at something I think I'm, the, um, Sean was talking or somebody else was talking about myth making. And I was thinking about this idea of myth making and the idea also somebody else was saying, you know, that we needed to have stories that were telling the truth because people were becoming interested in truth telling rather than uh, rather than this kind of myth building. And, and I think that for me, that's connected to the larger political question, the geopolitical questions of, you know, all the stuff around fake news and the kind of, if you like, language becoming stripped of its meaning, like these words not meaning anything anymore. And also yeah. one thing just on a purely personal level that I'm puzzled about is why, and someone can correct me if they do already, why luxury brands aren't contributing to addressing the balance in terms of, um, you know, um, inequity. If you want to talk about global geopolitics, you know, why is money not being funneled back in, you know, by luxury brands? Because I understand they're doing very well right now. So I'd be curious to know why there's not a tax on luxury that goes directly into, you know, addressing geopolitical questions. So that puts my politics right out there on the table for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, thank you. That's a great point. Um, and, and Mark, before we move on, um, or before yeah. we would like to just chime in. Sure. I mean, I would sort of, I, I think, agree with um, Sheena and particularly around the whole idea of um, myth making um, and building, I suppose, a narrative, which kind of obviously suits your commercial agenda. Um, and that is something which, to a certain extent, has also fueled this idea of, you know, it's, it's kind of convenience marketing. So it's kind of... I suppose this constant stream of messages, uh, bite-sized, easy to digest, um, and leave you, I suppose, feeling like you know and understand and have been contacted, um, but at the same time, rather empty in terms of actual explanation for what's actually going on there. Um, and I think it's something whereby we're seeing an uprising in people, um, rightly so, asking more questions um, to make those important inquiries. Um, it's something I think that can only begin to sort of unravel this whole myth around luxury um, in more detail as more and more people become aware of the geopolitical landscape of how supply chains work um, and actually kind of think uh, constructively and be analytical when you're actually looking at a business um, and seeing, you know, how many stores do they have worldwide? How many products are on that shelf? how many times are they actually selling that product and give you some sense of, you know, this so-called exclusive marketplace, um, you begin to realize that actually it's, it's vast. Um, and I think that's something that becomes cloaked in this um, myth around luxury being unattainable and exclusive. Um, whereas when you actually look into it, you begin to realize that actually, um, you know, it's out there and accessible. And then it doesn't sort of resonate as being authentic because of that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just an interesting comment coming in here as well regarding um, the cloud. Um, it's so an interesting parallel with myth building and the cloud. Maybe the cloud can be seen as a luxury space, mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting one. Um, which maybe I'll let you guys uh, mull that over for a minute. I did want to unpack this idea a little bit more and sort of bring in sort of the idea of morality slightly as well. Um, and just does the idea of luxury, is it completely, you know, um, is it morally reprehensible in the current climate with wealth disparities and, and with civil unrest and with all the other issues that we've been sort of discussing and that I think Sheena was kind of pointing her uh, finger to? Or do you feel that there can be um, sort of a positive moral impact um, you know, from, from luxury or, or brought about by luxury brands? And do you think luxury or luxury brands can be a force for positive social change? Which, um, you know, as you say, it doesn't appear that they are doing that, but I don't know if anyone wanted to, um, to weigh in on that. Silvio, perhaps you might have a few thoughts. Yeah, again, uh, you know, that's not my kind of field of expertise, but I can say personally, the way I see it is, um, uh, you know, uh, luxury for me, it's about, um, partially it's about access, it's about aspiration and all that. And it's built within this definition, the fact that it is um, exclusive by definition, which means that you need to exclude people <laughs> in order to function. Otherwise, it's not it's not a democratic tool per se. You know, there are other things that are more democratic than probably luxury. So um, the idea of using luxury as a sort of um, means to, to arrive to a sort of more uh, kind of balanced situation and a kind of social level, that it's very interesting. I have no idea how it might operate, but it, it's certainly a very good idea. <laughs> I don't know if 
colleagues or the panelists might have some something to add on that. But I, I will certainly be interested to know how we can use that. I, well, I, have, I have a thought on that, that I, if it's okay for me to jump in, if I, just on that point, because I think that um, I, I don't think that luxury brands can uh, can affect change unless they're going to actually address, as, as we talked about, supply chain, dirty hands, you know, the legal ramifications, you know, the idea that you do the minimum and you, you just get you just get through the legislation. This isn't just luxury brands, you know, all, all companies do this on some level. Um, but I do think that there's there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's an issue with luxury if you go back and you really I really loved what the conversation earlier um, with Chris and uh, Father Andrew about the kind of if you like this other ethical space of luxury and one of the things I'd like to pose is this notion of self-care and this idea of returning to, to a notion of luxury not of luxury branding but as something that's about actual care for the self you know which has historical roots in you know deep in you know philosophical thinking but this idea that for example when we all went into lockdown I joked with Sean I'm of the generation where I can make things I actually know how to sew I know how to bake I'm okay I'll be fine throughout lockdown because I actually have an I have an ability to create things and for me that was a great luxury the luxury of being able to perform a certain kind of self-care so I think what we're looking at is maybe we just need to rethink what we mean by luxury for ourselves because the brands are going to do what they're going to do but I do think they should be uh, taxed at about 25 to 30 percent what they earn and that money should go back to addressing um, uh, poverty and uh, global inequities I, I really do anyway that's my two pence worth thank yeah. you Sheena I, I think particularly also when um, I suppose a lot of luxury um, the, the the message I suppose is seen as being aspirational so you're looking at sort of inspiring people to buy and indulge and participate um, through ideas which um, actually promote, you know, again, the sort of commercial agenda of the company that's actually um, making those claims. And I think from a morality perspective, it's also whether or not those aspirations are actually seen to be something which actually um, do, do they um, lead you to a happier place? Um, do they actually give you the sort of um, quality of life that um, you feel is important? Or are you essentially beginning to just essentially absorb and consume somebody else's idea about what your life should be like? Um, and I think it was interesting just with what Father Andrew was saying earlier about with um, his Aristotle sort of reference to, you know, a significant and happy life, you know, is something which you can really only find yourself. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Peter, can I ask if you've got an opinion on this? Um, I think uh, Sheena's exactly right. I mean, it depends what you call luxury. Um, so it's got, he's, he's, you know, I like his argument, uh, if enough people uh, decide on, on that's a certain thing or event or is, lux is, a, is a luxury, that's, then it is. Um, society dictates that. But what I don't um, find appealing is the fact that um, through a commerce and um, a top-down sort of uh, driven, the idea, the storytelling is driven into us that certain thing is luxury when it's not. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone want to um, come back on any of these comments or should we move on to another question? I'm just curious, Peter, why, why uh, do you not think that's what brands do all the time? They constantly tell us stories about things, whether it's luxury or someone else. Is that the point you're making? I'm just curious about what you're pushing back there. Um, am I on? Um, yes, no, well, um, no, I understand this whole branding thing. I'm just not a big fan of it. Um, I understand that, um, you know, if you can have garments that is, have a certain stitching and it's a, it's a lot more uh, beautifully done than something else. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trying to get to grips with this concept at a, at a level that um, there's this guy called Varela. Varela operates on Francisco Varela. And... Um, it's not that gold has disappeared and that golden is suddenly the new flavor of the month. It's the fact that all that's happened in um, our lifestyles has just brought this thing forward. So these two things are transparent. They're not ambiguous. And they exist together. Um, uh, I think if you read Varela's, I think it's called um, uh, The Ecology. Or, oh, forget. I'll, I'll message you and tell you what that book is. It's brilliant. He goes into, uh, they, they do a little Buddhist um, venture out into Buddhism, which I'm not 
all that, um, you know, but I can understand what it is that they're saying about this, uh, about this whole phenom phenomenon of, um, they call it um, uh, um, phenomenological cognition or something like that. Anyway, I, I put it this way, I'm not a big fan of the commercially driven stuff. And I'm not a big fan, fortunately, of what you are, of equity and that sort of thing. I believe um, luxury is something that is, uh, is a byproduct of um, the circumstances we're in. I uh, think a couple of people have spoken about it, especially people that have been in the concentration camps. I forget the one really good author. Um, but they would they were saying that at a certain point um, uh, they they there was a sort of certain sort of sense of self actualization, uh, and I believe that's where we're starting to look at luxury uh, in the true sense of the word. Anyway, I've, I've spoken too much. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm sure we'll get some questions on that from uh, in the Q and A session as well. Um, I suppose sticking with the sort of the broad theme of, of the pandemic, but also the impact of technology. Um, I'm interested in how this is changing uh, the spaces or the spaces of consumption for luxury. Um, I'm thinking here like the impact perhaps of social media, especially in the past year that we've all been kind of living isolated in our, in our homes. Um, how, I mean, I suppose, yeah, just what, what, are your, what are your sort of thoughts on social media and luxury, both in terms of how it's redefining it um, and, and how it's watering it down, you know. I mean, obviously, there's the links in with brand issues um, and also, again, like I say, with, with space in terms of being you know, behind computers these days rather than actually in locations and things of that nature. Silvio, can I get your thoughts on that? Please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned two types of spaces now. You mentioned the store space, but also the kind of the space that we are all in today, so behind our screens. But there is also a third space, which is, you know this this particular discussion is relevant is the space um if you want to call it that is but you know where you go into a social media app instagram for instance that you you do have a series of uh, banner and you know there, there is a certain space where you have images where you have text where you have logos so, you did, so it's in some it's a sort of speciality there um so that's a space that we inhabit somehow visually but we do inhabit it um, and then it's becoming increasingly important because obviously it's it's a subtle space. It's a space that is new to us. We're not um, historically um, used to it. It's, it's something you still get to terms with. But um, I think it's um, it's a new experience for for, for us, uh, you know, as it were. And there are people who actually take advantage of this new space, like you know the influencers, for instance. There are people who are. Um, I suppose make the most of it they, or, or change the way in which we perceive those spaces. Um, yeah, I think I shut up now. But <laughs> thanks, Celia. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, Fina, can I get you to uh, to jump in on this one as well? Well, um, okay. Well, again, opinions only my own. Um, I don't think there's much in social in, in social media that's worthwhile, really really um, um, kind of um, look, well, not looking at, but um, I just rejoined Instagram after a long hiatus. And it was interesting because everybody was jumping on me going, oh my goodness, you're back on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, calm down. It doesn't matter really um, whether I'm there or not. I think it's just full of lies and trivia. And it's one of the reasons that I just don't engage with it. So I have very strong opinions on these matters. Um, you know, I have done, but I, but I don't. So, so for me, you know, the luxury for me is the luxury of stepping back from social media. And that goes to my point about the luxury of self-care and about, you know, a kind of space that you create where you can have the luxury of time. And also, I really, really liked what Sean was saying about the touch of the hand. You know, and the idea of the touch of the hand being a kind of, you know, kind of something that's been lost out of the framework of how we understand, how we understand true luxury, if you like, the truth of luxury. I just don't think you're going to find these things anywhere near social media. I think it's a whole other very surface level, very kind of simplistic space that is problematic. So, again, opinions only my own with a disclaimer. I know, it's good to get these opinions. I, I, I suppose having a social media holiday could become the, the new luxury spa day in the future. I'm sure someone's going to read them and sell us that. I think somehow. they already are. I'm sure they already are. You know, it's like a day off from the social media space. Yeah, it's the ultimate form of luxury. I mean, yeah. that and of course Zoom would 
be a nice uh, welcome holiday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we might all, all agree. Um, okay, well, uh, Mark, get your perspective on that, please. Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot obviously happening in the world of technology. Um, you know, it's something which is rapidly evolving and changing on a daily basis. Um, one of the things that I did find quite refreshing, I suppose Sylvia picked up on this earlier about obviously influencers sort of finding their space and about how different companies are using those influencers. And to a certain extent, I think there's suddenly there's an honesty to the marketing in that this person person, you know, followers is being paid to influence <laughs> um, a target audience. Uh, and so there's obviously this sudden realization that actually, you know, this person, they're, they're, they're being paid to change my mind. <laughs> and so often that is obviously to do with whether or not, you know, I'm going to buy this handbag um, because it looks great on you and I'm sure it'll have the same impact on, on me. Um, so that, that's a very visible space. And also it's interesting, I suppose, how a lot of those um, social media providers, um, they force this template. Uh, so, you know, it's also about how that information is packaged. And so you're kind of scrolling through, you know, window after window. Um, and essentially it begins to become very drab in that it looks, you know, it, it, it kind of all looks the same. Um, the same similar sorts of messages, similar sorts of shots, similar sorts of things going on. And so it becomes very, very difficult to actually distinguish yourself amongst that constant stream um, of supposedly new ideas and, and things that are happening, things that are going on. So I think, you know, it obviously then means that there's a certain amount of re-evaluation of that as a, as a, as a, as a marketing medium. Um, particularly when you want to be quite sort of controlling over the message that you're communicating. Um, but also, as we spoke about earlier, it sort of opens it up to the value that then happens um, coming the other way, uh, where you have lots of um, user interesting parties that are then posting comments, that are then sort of offering some sort of advice, offering some sort of um, opinion. Um, Interesting, you know, I was quite interested in recycling, and so there was lots of things going on on Twitter, particularly from Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Um, and then it was interesting just looking at all the comments about about their sort of um, um, uh, their, their contribution to plastic waste. You know, what are they doing about it? So it's almost as if this whole PR activity is kind of turned on its head and becomes something which is quite sort of damaging to the brand, particularly when they had difficulty answering it. So I think there's some interesting ways in which, you know, tech is beginning to tip things the other way. Um, um, and I, th I think there's a lot that can be said for um, how those new areas, obviously because of the, the growth and the engagement, I think a lot of companies are looking at it as being, we need to be on the internet, you know, we need to have our social media presence, we need to be engaging um, to participate. But that's also going further in that, you know, with um, Louis Vuitton and using avatars from gaming. Um, and it's kind of looking at how you, you know, gaming is a huge market. So obviously, if you're able to then kind of tap into a massive gaming market, which maybe isn't looking at their social media accounts of luxury goods, suddenly they're kind of exposed to it through the use of a particular medium quite cleverly uh, to begin to engage a whole other area uh, and potential customer base. So I think there's some interesting kind of crossovers going on, and it'll be interesting to see you know, how they pan out and develop over time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Louis Vuitton's an interesting one because... Um, on one hand, they've diversified their brand very in a, a very effective way, I think. Because on, on one hand, they're sort of high art and that collaboration um, with that kind of the classics of, of, of art and civilization um, mm. as a key aspect of the brand. And then on the other hand, they, you know, they, they've worked on collaborative projects with Supreme and various other streetwear brands um, and are really tapping into a completely different demographic and doing these co-branded, you know, luxury luxury items that are, you know, but with, with this kind of skateboard brand. And then again, I think that the example that you use with, with gaming is very interesting. So I find it is interesting how uh, with technology and social media, um, increasingly brands are able to maybe diversify themselves and, and to some, some degree, some are successful and others are kind of alienating their, perhaps their, their core, their core audience or their core consumer. Um, but that's enough. Oh, sorry, go on, Matt. Yeah, no, I, was just, I think it is something, obviously I think the, um, particularly from a, 
I suppose, a new creation of innovative spaces. You know, it's also once that sort of, you know, that gaming technology and also, you know, Chanel and Louis Vuitton have also started to look at um, um, augmented reality, you know, and about how then that space then changes, you know, the actual physical reality um, becomes um, augmented with digital content. And so it's something which is only beginning to be explored. And I think to a certain extent, it does require some of those big players to kind of get involved and really push it to kind of see what can happen. Um, but at the same time, there's also some danger in that then it becomes um, something which uh, supersedes, uh, I suppose, previous sort of narratives around who we are and what our core values are that kind of enabled us to become uh, a luxury brand in the beginning, suddenly become more increasingly eroded. Um, and then before you know it, you're sort of on the same sort of playing field as, as everybody else. Um, so it's almost as if actually some of these big gaming companies, whether they start releasing their own sort of fashion and, you know, handbag collections, I mean, they're in a perfect sort of position to do so. Plus, they've already got the, you know, the audience. Thank you. Uh, just James, like bring... can, I, can I add something? Yeah, okay, Sylvia, yeah, I'll bring you in here then, Peter, I promise you'll get your chance in a second. It's very quickly. It's just to say, I think we should also, within this context, consider that luxury brands, but equally luxury products, are not just clothing or technology. It's also stuff that happens uh, within video games. You know, the classic example is, uh, you know, as all of us who have been uh, spend our time in video games you will know this. Uh, you know, there are two ways in which you can um, progress uh, into levels within a game one way is the hard way is to spend time in it and literally try to 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 um, win all the challenges the second one is just to buy your way into the next level so that um that i suppose creates a difference between who those who can afford to actually pay money to to actually um, have a, a shortcut to the to the next level and that in that respect is a form of luxury as well so so I suppose luxury is, and also, you know, computers, for instance, you know, computers, there are, there is a huge market, uh, it's, it's, it's a growing market about um, luxury computers, you know, it's not just the uh, boring grey desktop, it's, you know, the, you might have some cool feature with, you know, kind of cooling uh, fumes and lights that, you know, so um, there is luxury for different people, that's what I'm trying to say, within technology, within video games as well. Sorry. Interesting. I suppose that throws questions about authenticity as well, in the sense that if you can purchase your way through the next level, are you really authentically experiencing uh, the gaming situation or what, what the priorities are there? Um, but that's enough for me. Peter, can I bring you in on this subject, please? Well, well I haven't got much to say because on Twitter you can only put on 50 characters and your head's full of mush. But um, <laughs> I would say that the, the thing about luxury on this stage is that you the access to information uh, that's luxury and not only that but then um, the way you engage with information you become something of a it becomes something of a completely unique experience so you you're pulling info off you're putting info back on and the only person that it can experience uh, what's happening to you uh, is yourself so it's pretty unique it's a uh, it's only you it's um and it's um it's something I reckon people could start making use uh, um, use of. It's almost like uniquely directed data, um, and it's a luxury. Thank you very much. Um, well, I've got a. I'm going to direct a couple more sort of more specific questions. So uh, first of all, this one goes out to the architects on the panel, really. But everyone would be welcome to you know put in their their ten cents too. So how do the architects on the panel define luxury architecture? Is it the design or is it the amount of money being paid for the project or is it the location? So yeah, how do you define luxury architecture? Um, and is it more about the design, about the amount of money being spent or about location? Um, I suppose well, I'm the worst architect here in this forum. So if you don't mind, I'll go first. I'll say it's about storytelling, but then it quickly becomes BS. So um, that's the problem. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> The problem with being an architect is, you know, what architects do, you've got an intimate knowledge of, of how you, you operate and um, it's a disadvantage as well. Anyway, I will hand over to Silvio, the decent architect. <laughs> I think we are in the same boat, Peter. But 
Um, I think I will try to continue Peter's point. I think it's a very good one um, in terms of storytelling and narrative. I think there is something that um, James, forgive me if I if I kind of um, cut across your question, but I think um, there is a very important relationship between the client, let's call it like that, so the brand and the architect. Uh, sometimes you choose you you know if there is a point in your expansion as a brand as a luxury brand where you really want a famous or star architect to build something just for you so that will become your not only your flagship store but will become also the symbol of kind of your wealth and your kind of success so and that's the reason why you know most of this um, you know very nice very famous buildings are designed by star architects uh, you know zadid and you know Norman Foster and all, all of those. I think, um, and because these architects are quite clever, they know that, they feel pressured to actually deliver something that is extraordinary. It's crazy, you know, it's, it's very expensive too. So they are, I suppose, invited to use very, very um, unique material, very expensive uh, technologies to, to do that. So it's basically a catch-22, if, if it makes sense. So it's not just the amount of money spent for the building it's not just a design it's it's all part of the same as peter was saying so it's, it's all the same narrative you want to be recognized as you're the only one who can afford this very special building and therefore i do it location yeah i mean of course you know if it's central if it's a kind of prime location it's it's important uh but not necessarily i mean we do have the example of um there is prada who actually did i mean dated now but who did a um, project which is a little tiny shop no people inside which is somewhere in Texas I guess it's, it's a very isolated place in the States uh, and they just did it because I suppose I mean I haven't been there but I suppose because they can <laughs> so they just did it mm -hmm. uh, but I suppose there are extreme location is important not necessarily prime location or central location but it's a combination of all these factors Thank you, Silvio. Um, would either of my other panelists like to uh, chime in on this particular subject? Uh, Sheena, Mark? No, I don't think so. Not on architecture. I'm sure Mark will have something to say. <laughs> Mark, do you have anything to add? Uh, Sheena. Okay. Um, well, I think that there is something around the idea of space, and particularly, I suppose, as architecture as a definition of space um, and I find particularly when I, I I don't know when you're kind of looking at the housing crisis in central London and the space that people have to live in and although you could see the actual um, you know the entranceway you know um, the atrium to some of these buildings um, and there's absolutely nothing in it mm -hmm. You know, it's just this idea of actually taking back and claiming space in order to create this impression. But at the same time, it also then starts to kind of look quite vulgar because of that complete sort of, um, I suppose, neglect for when you kind of um, have passed um, people on the street and they're living on the street and they're sleeping in the corner. You know, th th there's enough space in there to kind of house them. You know, <laughs> they could just walk, you know, they could actually live in there of an evening. And so there's this kind of, you know, it's, it's conflict between, I suppose, the actual, you know, the narrative and the, um, the, um, the impression that you want to take um, and create against a backdrop of else is actually going on around the city um, and is in the space and it's whether or not they are sort of um, um, recognizing that doing something about it or just completely sort of standing proud thank you that's very interesting as well i mean especially bringing in the idea of the the housing crisis there um i did want to ask something about language because i think language is quite important and um what i'll do is i'll i'll, I'll ask this question you're all welcome to answer but i'm going to ask it through Sheena, just because it relates to some of her work, if I'm not taking that out of context. Um, so Sheena, um, you, you've, you've argued that the language of luxury has been degraded. Um, do you think we can locate true luxury in language and history? We can locate true luxury in language and history. Um, it's a really, really, really good question. Um, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip that question slightly because I think yes, we probably could find it in in history, but I think we'd need to do a lot of very very deep looking at the origins of that word. Sean and I have many had many conversations about this point, 
But what I actually wrote about that I'm interested in is this idea that language itself is becoming a luxury. And what I mean by that is in the sense that, um, I mean, I'll just take make two comments. I, I would argue, for example, going back to some notions of desire and excess. I was I was delighted that uh, Chris was talking about Bataille and the notion of excess. Um, that poetry is the excess because it's not functional in the sense of language, something that describes or does a job that sort of points towards something. And then we have kind of, you know, language that does, does work in that way. So we could argue that poetry is the kind of luxury version of language, if you like. We desire it, we want it, but it doesn't, it's not necessary to the functioning of our lives. Other people could argue that it is, yeah, but I'm just making that point in a very kind of, you know, sort of simple way. But I'm actually just putting something in the chat for everybody. There was a story that came out recently, which I think really heightens this question of language in a really quite terrifying way. Some of you may be aware that uh, Timnit Gebru, who was a researcher in, at Google, was fired for um, revealing the fact that some of the the language models, the, 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 they're, they're full of bias, full of racial bias, full of all kinds of bias. And we know that this is a big thing in artificial intelligence right now. But what she actually identified and she got fired for it was that um, basically that Google was turning a blind eye to this. And this is where it relates to the question of luxury for me. I think authentic language is going to become a luxury because we're surrounded by lies. I think authentic language in terms of language made by human beings and not machines is going to start to slip away from us because you don't know half the time when you're going on social media these days, you know, whether you're speaking to a bot or not. Um, I had a really interesting argument with a bot one day. I was absolutely adamant that they were that they were they were they were a chat bot and they were just arguing back at me and I thought you're just a very sophisticated program. But they were they were really faking indignant, you know, being in, you know really indignant about the fact that I had said this. So for me, I think what's interesting about language is that we don't even realize right now that language itself is slipping away. So the luxury of speaking, of expressing my opinion, of really having agency and freedom of speech is something that we're going to see moving away into machines that are going to be controlling and dictating what we think, how we think. We won't even know who's speaking anymore at a certain point. It, might, it may be a long time off, but I do think that that is already happening. And that's why people like Timrit Gebru are being fired for pointing out that not only are these systems dangerous, but that they, they bring in all kinds of biases and they're problematic in many ways. So I've just flipped that slightly. I don't know if I answered your original question, but there it is. Yeah, no, and, and, I, and I think you're, you're also bringing, it goes back to some of the questions we were discussing with social media and I suppose language in general, whether it be fake news or the fact that we live in these, you know, these, these silos, these echo chambers, um, and we think we have a, you know, a conception or an understanding of what's going on outside, when in, in, in reality we're kind of listening to us, us out of the mirror. The mirror. Um, well, I think that's right. And I think what I'm trying to say is that that whole linguistic space is becoming a luxury, is the luxury of language in that sense of it being something that we own, that we can we can use. It's been co-opted and taken away from us by political agents, by, you know, by, by, by technologies, by all sorts of things. It's being stripped away from us without us even realising that's happening. No, I, I, I agree. It's a, it's a it's an insipid and slow process, but one which has had great impact already and will, I think, continue to have great impact in the future, both in terms of our, our, how, you know, our mm. buying habits, our consumer habits, um, but like you say, just to, and who we're talking to and the knowledge we have of that. Um, would anyone yeah. else like to come in on, on sorry, pardon me, Sheena, would no, anyone just, else just, come in just on, to this? on One quick thing, just to say, going back to your original question, yes, I do think history, I do think if we go back far enough, we, we, we can find a more authentic space for the word language, but right now it's just been emptied of meaning, you know, it's been just, you know, stripped out of what it, what it actually could refer to that's useful to us. Anyway. Oh, thank you, Sheena. Um, <clears throat> Peter, would you like to come in and, and, and talk on this subject? Uh, I completely agree. I, I, I was initially thinking of um, the luxury of um, of taking pictures and, and words and throwing them down on a piece of paper. The, the, the skill involved in producing something that's, um, that's, that's set apart as a luxurious um, artifact. Um, but um, it's more than what I did and I loved is this idea of poetry. It's luxury. So, Thank you very much. Uh, Silvio. Yeah, just to say, I love this idea of poetry too. I mean, I, I just the image of the that's that's it's fantastic. Thank you for that. But I would just to try to defend a little bit AI for a second, um, just to uh, say that um, behind uh, each artificial intelligence, let's call it like that, uh, there is somebody who is actually 
using language and specifically programming language to actually determine how the AI will actually operate. So there are languages behind this, this you know, these as well, um, which are new languages. I mean, I, you know, I, um, I was fascinated by somebody who said that you, you know, when you learn a programming language, you are kind of learn, you're like learning a foreign language, which is quite, which is quite interesting. And if you think that these languages are increasing in, in number, you know, potentially people are, and you know, it's, these languages are highly functional in that, you know, they have to um, be able to uh, express certain things you know the, for the program to work so uh, it's quite interesting uh, i think for me at least you know it's interesting to look at this 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 language that in a way we try to we create new languages to program something that will as china is saying will somehow influence the way in which we use our own language which is there mm -hmm. i think i find it fascinating but i'd like to just come back on that really briefly silvio and say yes i agree with you but if I speak, I have a kind of ethical relationship to what I say. And the problem is, and I think what uh, Timur Gabru was pointing out is that these systems that are absolutely using these languages are operating in the background with no ethical kind of responsibility for what they're saying out there in public space. So it's a different relationship to language, if you like, in that sense. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, Mark, would you uh, have anything to add to this discussion? Um, well, I think one of the main problems is how a lot of these new languages, specifically, I suppose, around code, um, they're understood by a few people, you know, but they don't have the same sort of prevalence, I suppose, as modern languages do. Um, and, and to a certain extent, when there's so much of what we um, do on a day-to-day -day basis is dependent on those languages, as so that line of computer code. Um, it's almost as if it's something which becomes invisible, you know, so the majority of users are, you know, they know it's there, but they have no idea what it is, what it's doing, how it works. Um, and so it's kind of almost, you know, need, uh, you need to sort of demystify all of that. But then it's kind of looking at it from the perspective of the complexities that then sort of emerge as a, as a result of that. Um, and also how those, um, I suppose th that complexity is delivered in quite a sort of easy to understand, um, user-friendly package um, that ideally, you know, sort of because of your um, historical profile, you know, the system knows that essentially I'm only going to give you one word answers because I know that you've only got time for one word answers as opposed to giving you uh, a few sort of carefully crafted sentences or a sort of an engaging argument, which is going to sort of pique your <laughs> curiosity um, in order to get you to engage with me. Um, and so I think that's when it starts to become quite, um, you know, again, it's the influences and it's those influences. There are even, you know, sort of um, virtual influences. So they don't actually exist. So they're 3D models that look very, very lifelike that have their own sort of social media campaign lifestyle. Um, and I think, you know, the majority of people understand that they are not real people, but, you know, they are blurring this boundary between, I suppose, what is um, what we think of as being as being real um, and also valid. You know, what, 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 where is the actual um, the validity in, in, in allowing me to. Yeah, sort of, um, you know, sort of validate that relationship and also to know what it's doing, what it's doing to me. Thank you. Um, so we're kind of rounding up here, but I've got another question because I really want to ask this idea of what's next, but I, I will try and um, tailor it into the idea of space as well. So space has physical, digital and philosophical manifestations, if you will. What does the future hold for each of these on each of these horizons? And um, I will start that one off with Peter, please. Oh. Um, well, I've got something written down here, which is, uh, is just going to sound pathetic. But when I started off with the analogy of ships, um, where to from here? Well, our modern day ships sail oceans in our minds. And that's all I've got to conclude with. 
Okay, thank you very much. That's, well, that's nice and abstract for us to ponder. Um, great. Well, Sheena, would you like to come in there? Well, I mean, you know, oh God, that's such a big question, isn't it? Know, we'll so... <laughs> so, no, no, it as, you, as you see fit. <laughs> I wrote one thing down on my paper, which I'll read, and I didn't finish the sentence, but I'll finish it now. I was wondering when I was hearing uh, the first uh, people speaking, you know, Chris and Father Andrew, is capitalism always at odds with the ethics of luxury? And for me, the kind of future really requires that thinking. You know, obviously, we're talking about companies that make money. And obviously, if capitalism falls, then arguably, you know, everything falls with it. You know, we live in a capitalist framework. And so I would just say that in terms of space, we need to find a way to reconcile the tensions between, you know, the, the ways in which you know the capitalist model and this whole thing we're talking about the geopolitical problems etc kind of sits within an ethics of luxury and i think it's really important that that we do that work because i think the world has changed and unfortunately i agree i don't know if it was veronica was saying the question is are we just going to go back to where we were before and i sadly think we will and so i think maybe there's a tiny 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 moment where we could seize that and really think about how that again might make us think and going back to one final point i think chris made that if we look at the kind of histories of philosophy and politics and, and it gives this looking at luxury gives us a lens to look at all these other things about, about what makes us human. Um, we're really talking about the difference between individualism, what I do for myself and community and how we relate to community. So I wonder whether the future might require a looking at the ethics of luxury around the idea of building, building a sense of how we're, we're together rather than separate, you know, when we, when we engage in this, that's all. Thank you, Sheena. Silvio, can I get your thoughts? Yeah, so I will try to frame this in kind of temporal terms. So um, as humans, we are, uh, I think the perception of physical space is hardwired in our senses. So we perceive space. And then, you know, you all have this experience, you know, when um, we perceive spaces through our senses, our senses are very, very well trained to, to actually understand. You know, the, the, the usual example is if you close your eyes, you 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 emit some noise and then you you should be able to understand how big is the room you're in whether it's a huge space or a small space it's simply because you're there using you know i suppose your ear you know with the reverberation of sound you know, so that we we just do it okay our brain is so well trained to do that well that's the first part that's a physical space and then it's something that you know it's it's a natural environment for us digital space is something new to us so we're still try to understand how it works and um you know it, it will it will take ages probably for us to, to to understand really in terms of our body because at the moment it is just literally a physical oh, sorry a visual experience we, we 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 interact with our screen we interact with our monitors and that that's about it you know when then the brain will actually do the rest uh, but we don't use any other senses at the moment um so I think if you want to link these to uh, to the kind of space of luxury, um, what my, my take on that is the I feel per, that's again that's like Sheena says is very personal kind of opinion here, but I feel like the extent to which the physical space has anything to do with um, luxury um, has run out. You know, it's 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 um, has finished its, its time basically. You know, we. We, and that's why I think what Peter and I were trying to say there with our article, it's about, you know, the gold, the luxury as gold, something that you can identify as a piece of metal has uh, run out this time. You know, I think we are looking now at a kind of that new uh, venue, um, which is that, again, this the digital, the digital realm is where um, we still don't know how luxury might evolve, but it, it, I suppose there is a huge space there for all of us to actually see what happened. And, you know, and uh, the biggest disappointment, I think we had this conversation with Mark and, and, and Sean and, and, and Veronica as well, uh, is to see how, you know, big potential the digital space can have in terms of luxury. But it's disappointing to see how little really big brands are doing in that. You know, they are, in, in best cases, they are just replicating the, what they do in the physical shop to the digital uh, element, which is a little bit, again, disappointing. Uh, in, the last point is about physical manifestation. I have no idea what we mean by saying that the space has a physical, philosophical manifestation. And that's probably because it's outside of my understanding. <laughs> Thank you, Silvio, appreciate that. Um, and Mark, would you like to add any comments? On, on what the future holds for our conceptions of space. 
Um, well, I, I think it's something which uh, it's both it's both expanding and contracting. So I suppose it's almost as if the um, um, the idea of complexity um, in the space around us is running away with itself. You know, there was a time, I suppose, when um, going back to what Peter was talking about, the idea of the journey um, and how you could sort of, uh, you know, sort of get on board a ship, you know, and sail across an ocean that had never been sailed before. And you didn't know what you were gonna find on the other side, if anything. Um, whereas now we all sort of sit in our armchair with a small device, which essentially can take us anywhere. Um, but it's taking us in a sort of digital context rather than the actual physical context. But it still allows us to kind of get some sense of all that's going on in the world um, to the point whereby it can become overloaded. You know, it, it overloads us um, to the point where we um, are all suffering uh, because of it. Uh, and it means that we then need to take back control. Um, you know, it's about us. You know, I'd advise everybody, you know, it's like turn off notifications. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> but suddenly the relief that that offers is um, is amazing. <laughs> so it's just doing simple little things like that, I think, which can help us take control of, of, of the digital space, uh, but also look at how we can then begin to redefine it in the context of luxury um, as somewhere, I think, which it, it should... I suppose, reveal something about ourselves that is unexpected. It should be something which kind of um, delivers on that whole idea of discovery, um, which I think at the moment is taking, I think it's still happening within the scientific community. Um, but I think that there's still a lot to actually, um, I suppose, unveil and, and discover as we begin to kind of balance these two different sort of spaces so that hopefully, you know, they complement each other and work together in a, in a good way. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, well, that kind of brings us to an end uh, for this panel, but we still have some time. We're running a little about 10 minutes late, um, but we, we've still got time for uh, about 20 minutes of uh, q and if everyone wants to sit patiently with us. So yeah, thank you all for your insightful comments and reflections. Uh, it's been really fascinating. Um, and thanks to the previous panels too. Um, so I'm just going to check in here. I've got some questions um, from the audience, but if the audience members would like to send them in, that's great. Um, I'm also just going to check with Sean whether we would prefer people to ask their own questions or whether you would like me to. I know there's been a couple of questions on, on that. Sean, would you like me to ask the questions or would you prefer if people ask them themselves? As that could be, it could get a bit messy, but I can see that there's a couple of people have asked um, I, I, you can judge. I think that if there are questions that people would like to ask themselves, it's fine. But I see there are quite a few questions in the Q&A. So, um... Well, first of all, perhaps I can just say, uh, Peter, someone, uh, an anonymous attendee, um, has, uh... has asked, has said, are, are you thinking of the web of life by the late Francisco Varela or the embodied mind, perhaps, in regards to the book you were discussing earlier on? So embodied mind. Embodied mind. Right. So if anyone was yeah. interested, beautiful book. Following up, the embodied mind by Varela. Um, excuse my pronunciation. So do check that out if anyone's interested in taking what people was talking about further. Um, right. Let me just see what we've got here. Okay. So I've got a question here again from another anonymous attendee. Does the panel have any thoughts, re the potential for local entrepreneurs with niche luxury product service services? Uh, moving into and contributing to redefining our currently failing high streets. It's interesting. Um, so, for example, with locally produced products, locally grown foods, vegan beauty care, making experiences, etc. So that's interesting because, I mean, I, I suppose in many cities um, you see a lot of these things, but maybe in the, the form of high end farmers markets rather than them in, inhabiting an actual physical space. So um, that's quite interesting. So, yeah, do, does the panel have any thoughts regarding the potential for local entrepreneurs with niche luxury products and services moving into and contributing to redefining our currently failing high streets? So I guess that includes all the boarded up shops and spaces. Um, Peter, I've got you on the screen, so perhaps I'll ask you first. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. But, uh, you know, once we get over this whole pandemic um, you know, at the moment, high streets are just uh, a shadow of their former self. But um, I've written a couple of papers, not to 
Prague, but they are on ResearchGate or Academia, but uh, I've gone into quite a bit of depth as far as my uh, level of understanding goes into high streets and visual sustainability. And it links back to physical use and visual use. Uh, physical use and visual use will get tied up in that question. Thank you, Peter. Um, Sheena, can I bring you in on that question too? Yeah, sorry, I had to check something there. Um, yeah, I, I'm like I'm really liking these last two questions. We've got one from the anonymous attendee that you just asked, and also somebody called Ida's asked. I wonder if you think it's possible to make money on luxury and still be ethical. And the reason why I'm tying those two things together is I think they're related for me. I'd love to think that you know by supporting local, you know local, you know local makers and really celebrating craft and making would resolve would resolve this issue. I entirely take the point that I was raising that you need to make some money and some profit in order to put it back in. And that's completely true. But I think, you know, I think true, I mean, I teach in art schools and I see that students are celebrating craft now. They're very interested in learning skills. They're interested in learning how to make things and how to do that well. So I'm seeing a revival of that as, an, as a kind of opposite opposition to what Mark was pointing out earlier, which is the kind of very much the same visual surface of everything. And so I think that what I'd like to say is I think these two last questions there for me are really at the core of it. We'd have to commit to a notion of luxury, which is about celebrating craft, teaching people crafts as skills, being able to bring that back into the general life of the community, rather than luxury being about, I go out and buy an expensive handbag, not to be rude, but just to say, you know, it's about me, not about me contributing to the world outside and sort of building better communities. So I'd love to think that that was possible, but I recognize it's hard. A redefinition perhaps in the short term. Um, Silvio. Yes. Is it, do you want me to comment on, on this point, the high street? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, I don't know if you can see them, but basically, um, have you got any thoughts about the potential? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was reading the other question. That yeah, we feel free well. to answer. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. No, I, I will comment on this. Um, uh, I, I kind of, you know, I've done some work with Peter about this and in terms of high street and what are the important or key points in the high street in order for the high street to be sustainable and survive and all that. Um, I will add to that, that I think the problem is, is a little bit wider is the fact that high streets are normally um, designed uh, with the minds of sort of very old outdated planning, planning um, theory behind the fact that you live somewhere, you take your car, you drive to, to the high street or near the high street, um, and therefore you can go there. So I think um, obviously the, the, the houses, you know, standing on the I street or by the I street, you know, that they are fine. You know, people can just walk there, but it's a very minority of people. It is a very small number of people. And therefore this high street can survive. And therefore people, if I need to jump on my car to go to high street, I'd rather go to the shopping center because I can find more things there. Uh, I suppose that's the logic that prevents, one of the logic that prevents high street to thrive. So I think if we want to turn them into some sort of um, luxury uh, offer, then probably the whole infrastructural system needs to be rethought. That's my opinion. So it's, it's a wider problem. It's not just changing what is in the high street. It's it, how we use it, how we get there. Thank you, Silvio. Uh, Mark, can I bring you in on this uh, topic as well, please? Still there, Mark? I'm unmuted. There you go. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I would agree with Silvio. I suppose there's a certain amount of um, historical context with the actual makeup and the layout of the high street, and particularly from a you know again a, a commercial gain. It's how many you know how many how many square feet can we sort of um, pack into this um, area, and how much money can we make from it? And then the, I suppose, the, you know, the players that then sort of participate in that become, um, you know, is the, the, they're drawing in the customers um, and the community then becomes something which is very much about shopping. Um, and I suppose it's the shopping or the idea of shopping, um, you know, it, it's like you can drive to a huge sort of shopping mall and everything's there and it's convenient because you can park and then there's a huge range of different shops inside. 
Um, but it's also something which then I think from a local perspective can begin to kind of address maybe the, um, you know, the local community in a bit more of a meaningful way. Um, so there's also, I suppose, the idea that those um, people that are living in those areas, um, they don't necessarily have access to the kind of shops that they need in order to actually um, live on a day to day basis, maybe it requires a drive or a, you know, a journey to actually kind of get to those different places. And I think the, you know, there's been some experiments over in um, uh, Sloan Square, I suppose, we're trying to kind of get some sort of authentic little sort of streets whereby there's a, you know, a grocer, a baker, a little coffee shop, you know, a little restaurant. And so, you know, the makeup is such that it's something which appeals to um, somebody that might be out and it sort of has everything that they need, but also it maybe um, sort of uh, addresses some of the local uh, need in the area as well. Um, and that also then sort of leads on, everybody's talking about experience and I suppose stores are looking at how can they begin to introduce experience. So it's not just about actually going and um, buying something, um, a physical object, but it's also, you know, what, what have you got to do in order to get that physical object? Um, and what else can you actually um, provide in terms of, of um, I suppose, experience, education, um, even in the customer's opportunity to step in and personalize and customize, make it their own. Um, and so you kind of then have a more sort of culturally rich sort of sector of activity, uh, which can help, I think, well, you know, <laughs> it remains to be seen, but to see whether or not that would help um, sort of regenerate uh, the high streets at the moment. Would any of my other panelists from the previous session like to come in on this topic as well? Anyone have anything to add? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll say something, uh, James. Thank you. Thanks. Tom. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, the high street, I mean, I think it's obviously it's a big issue at the minute because um, home delivery is here to stay and, and perhaps grow even more, isn't it? So um, and the high streets are in trouble. There's no doubt about it. And, and but the other thing is. Over the last 20, 30 years, the high streets have all started to look the same haven't they they're, they're pretty much all the same and uh, even the, even the architecture on them and i think there's opportunities here for um communities or localities to to produce something different to do something different and uh, and i think i think it was sheena said about um uh, you might actually get to talk to a human being and i think that's another thing that um the the, the local shops or um can do rather than uh, uh, COVID's accelerated this whole trend towards technology. And I think the standard items that will be forever now, um, but for uh, something more at the luxury, more bespoke, more um, artisan, then the locality is probably the place. Thank you, Simon. Um, would anyone else like to come in on this question before we move on to uh, another one? I'd like to say something, actually. I'm sorry, I've got <laughs> way too many thoughts on this. I'm from uh, Redcar, Middlesbrough. I'm from quite a poor area. And, um, you know, I've lived in London most of my adult life, but that's where I'm from. And my family comes from areas where there used to be all these little bespoke shops in town. Well, when I say bespoke, I mean, you know, the greengrocers and, you know, and uh, the butchers and whatever. And it was all very, very local, right? But the truth of it is that now people get in the car and they drive out to the big supermarkets because they actually can't afford to shop at these like bespoke artisan type of places and even if they were there in those areas which are really struggling financially I think we've got to be a little bit careful I'm saying this to myself as well you know of saying okay we do this and I think that's all fantastic um, you know but the, the difficulty is we might be in a little bit of William Morris territory which is to say it's all very good you know having those politics but how do those politics actually work for people who actually can't afford to buy these things? So I'm just saying there's, I'm just throwing up that caveat here to myself as well. Thank you, Sheena. Um, well, in, I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, so this one's actually directed to Federica. So Federica, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between luxury and art or between luxury brands and art? She's left. He's left. Well, would anyone else like to? I mean, Veronica, perhaps you might want to discuss that. Right. I think I've, I mentioned, you know, that there, there has been that long history and certainly 
Um, you know, the, I, I could speak, for example, about the Louis Vuitton brand, you know, and the, the idea of creating a foundation, you know, was really an attempt to, to even go beyond the, you know, because there was, of course, commercial collaboration with artists within, you know, the store and with, with products. And then the, uh, for example, in the Champs-Élysées, there is this espace, uh, cultural space upstairs, which is part of the store. And then the next, you know, move is to create this kind of utopian space that's um, outside of the commercial realm. And I think really to be within the world of museums and to be not only participating in culture, but really having this feeling that one is creating culture and, and, and a patron of the arts. And I think also like semiotically, the location of that foundation in the Bois de Boulogne, also overlooking Paris, you know, not part of Paris, but above Paris in this kind of UFO kind of um, architectural space that's created. And it really serves a purpose of, um, you know, kind of creating an eternal, you know, this getting back to this eternal connection of luxury and stepping away from the cash registers and the commerce and the numbers. And I think that that really is something that, you know, we see with Prada, with Gucci, having these kinds of foundations and, and these uh, extravagant spaces of art and of contemporary art. So really grounding oneself in art is a way of creating prestige, creating, um, you know, really linking back with those fundamental aspects of luxury that may be lost when, again, a lot of the products are really mass produced. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Veronica. Um, so I was just going to say to the panelists, if you would like to answer one of these, the, most of these questions are quite generic, but so uh, or coming in for the panel as a whole, and there's a lot of you. So if you would like to answer the question, would you unmute yourself? So I've got an idea of who's who's keen and who's interested. Um, with that in mind, let's see where we're at here. Okay, well, I think we're ready to move on then by, uh, by that, unless anyone wants to jump in. Um, if not, then I do actually have a question for Chris. Um, Chris, again, thank you for your contribution earlier. It was, it was, it was wonderful. And um, if anyone does have any questions for Chris or any of the panelists from either session, now is a great time to, uh, to raise them. Um, but Chris, this one relates to luxury um, in general. So basically, is it available to everyone? Is luxury, sorry, pardon me. Is it really luxury if it is available to everyone online or digitally? Or said differently, does not luxury exist and thrive only because it is exclusive, has limited availability, high quality, and is expensive? Or, or I suppose, do you see, you know, we, are, we, are we renegotiating what we perceive to be luxury? Or is that kind of still what it is? Well, I've tried to re renegotiate it, not persuading anybody, um, <laughs> by saying, in fact, there, there is no necessary connection between any of those things uh, and, and luxury. Um, the... In a sense, the, the real weasel word is probably exclusivity. Um, and that doesn't need to be unpicked, it, it seems to me. Uh, it's how, who's, who's being excluded and what's the means of exclusion. Uh, we're not talking sumptuary laws. So in one sense, it's not a legal factor that you exclude people from consuming certain things, though historically that's been very important. So then you're looking at what, what are the, the, who's excluded. And it's only got to be a certain category of people. It's the people who want something that many people want something that few have. It can't be, I'm completely indifferent to a world, around the world cruise, which could be well, it's luxury, but it, it, I'm not, it could be exclusive, but I, it's not exclusive to me. I don't care a damn about well, around the world cruise. So it's got to be a category of people who, um, many of them, uh, who want what a few have. And this is, I've always thought since I've worked on this, but admittedly not recently, um, is that a lens, to use the, that word again, um, is the sort of snob bandwagon concept of, of consumption. Uh, snob goods and bandwagon goods. Uh, and luxury manufacturers or producers or whatever you want to call them um, have an ambivalent relationship to that. Um, they want to maintain a sort of snob cachet, yet obviously generate bandwagons. Uh, and it's the dynamic between those two things uh, there are many ways characterizes the dynamics, it seems to me, of, of, of luxury production um, and, and consumption. Um, and therefore, it, it's not really an issue about uh, price. Price is simply a rationing mechanism. Um, luxury doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be rare. Um, it just, well, my analysis anyway, that, that's part of the thrust of it. Um, 
And basically, I was, uh, this is like better sort of machinery in a way. Um, language is fluid. You can't pin language down. Language is, is full of metaphor and like totes and hyperbole and all the rest of it. Uh, and you can never legislate out what luxury is. Um, and I was struck listening to the conversations because um, one of the ways I've always tried to look at things is look at the antonym. What are we contrasting this with? What's the context in which the, this is taking place? And often this afternoon, I got the impression that something like restriction was the opposite. That luxury was something that wasn't restricted. So it was freedom to choose. Freedom is where, I mean, she mentioned or something else, I mean, time. Uh, I'd like the time to do this. But time is simply a word here. It's really what you do with the time is what's important. It's the fact you have a choice to do something with time. And for me, the luxury cuts in is what you do with the time. Um, and they, they can do various things. Now you can in fact go and shop in the high street <laughs> with your time, or you can decide to invest in a round the world cruise for your time, with your time. Uh, those things to me are, are, are open questions. So it, I don't, I just try to, in my own account, analyze what's going on. And most of the, the use of luxuries is simply metaphor. It, it's a term for something that's other, not restricted, free, it's not mass produced, all these other antonyms going around. Um, and I was in, I just tried to unpick it. Uh, and a purely sort of intellectual exercise in a way, uh, I wasn't sort of saying in the end, this is what you know luxury is because no one can legislate for that. I tried to I develop a, a conceptual analysis. One, one, if I can ask one other, pick up one other point while I've got the floor. Uh, the notion about the contemporary world and what next and, and the place of luxury in that. Somebody, I think maybe Sheena again, mentioned about taxation. Um, and I say quite a lot about that in my book um, because one of the things about luxury is because it is easily substitutable it's easily taxable uh, one example that's very recent in the uk uh, botox well they, what they're called injections are now vat rated because they're optional whereas cosmetic surgery isn't now that's my point about the necessity luxury dynamic characterizing a society and how they how they cut things up so in one way you can use luxuries and it has been historically to say these are things easily substitutable so we can tax them if people want to spend the money on them they'll spend the money on them uh, and you'll get money from it or you won't so it's a balancing act then between the authorities what's the right rate to tax thing but these are all political questions in a sense they're not definitionally connected to to luxury and you can have a windfall tax on luxury, you know, define luxury products as arbitrarily and a windfall tax, just like they do for electric companies or maybe Google now. But these are sort of political discussions which make sense. And I've tried to see how luxury fits into that sort of dialogue and that concern. That, so really long winded answer and I've spoken too long this afternoon anyway. Uh, those are some of the things that occurred to me from this afternoon um, anyway. I'll stop. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. Um, just, a, just a question to the audience here. If you've got any specific questions for any of our panelists, do, do send them in and just mention who they're for. Um, would anyone else like to come in on that subject that, we, um, that we've just been discussing? Um, if not, I've got rather an interesting one here. Just bear me a second, I'll dig it up. Okay. Basically relates to academia and luxury and the study of ac academia and luxury. Do you think it's global um, or, or in, is it globally inclusive or do we need to work more towards kind of bringing in boys from different continents um, and from different different locations? I'll ask that one of, of Sean, I think, just because it seems to be directed to him. Um, just repeat or, the or, question, um, James. <laughs> You, basically, do do you think um, that luxury as a study in academia is uh, is inclusive of global voices, or do we need to work more towards being more inclusive of people from different locations around the world or different economic backgrounds? Um, and and again, that comes into the symposium as well. 
and how would you intend to include more global voices in this specific context? That's an interesting question, and it's um, quite a complex question. Um, if we think about um, university education as it stands, and more, I think, more so in the UK probably than elsewhere, there is a um, drive, um, and Sheena's going to fall off a chair, to decolonize our curriculum. Um, and there are... I think it's with all good intention that education is inclusive because and it's, and and especially creative education because um what we do thrives on diversity which is something that I said earlier part of the problem we have I think is that many institutions are not really open to collaborate um which is slightly problematic when you want to um, kind of, uh, I suppose, turn our students into global citizens who are aware, culturally and socially aware, of things outside of their own kind of domains. But I must say that as educators, you know, our intention is always to be aware and inclusive and to address issues that are outside of, you know, sometimes our own kind of knowledge base. That, you know, that's what we do, because as creatives, we are inquisitive. But I think that, of course, we want to, you know, be inclusive um, and do projects. Uh, you know, I do projects all over the world because I have an invested interest. And I know, maybe, you know, most of the people we work with have that invested interest in doing that. Um I'm not quite sure if this is answering the question, but, you know, I think, you know, if it's, you know, related to luxury education, you know, I don't know that such a thing exists. You know, you can do postgraduate studies in, um, you know, luxury brand management and things like that. But those typically are not kind of inclusive subjects because they tend to focus on luxury, which comes out of either Europe um, or, um, you know, America is not the greatest um purveyor of a kind of luxury products but that you know there is a you know there is an, a kind of emergent luxury market there um, so luxury studies tends to be about things typically European and that disregards a lot of the things you know like Ken was saying you know that come out of Africa for example you don't have luxury studies in African craft or in African product you don't have luxury studies in Chinese um, um, ceramic or Japanese um, um, knife making, for example. If, you know, there were these opportunities to do things like that, then I think we'd see a much more kind of diverse um, approach to, um, you know, studying things that are more inclusive and less exclusive, maybe not exclusive in the terms that um, uh, Chris refers to them, but exclusive in terms of kind of, um, you know, the, uh, within a kind of educational remit. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, in relation to that, I've got a question for, for Kenneth coming in from the audience. Um, the audience would love to hear more about your visions and ideas about bringing luxury to the rest of the world. What do you want to see in, say, the next five years? And that's for you, Kenneth. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will, I, will, I will come in from the most recent question, the one that uh, Sean addressed. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, luxury, um, especially the luxury as we know it, is not only colonial, um, with a lot of colonial underpinning, um, in the sense that when you talk about luxury, the first metropoles that come to mind is all that dominates, uh, all that dominates is, is, is European in, in, in nature. It's not only colonial, but it's actually, if I should use a term from South Africa, it's xenophobic uh, because you, I remember um, at the IPOL conference in Cape Town, I asked a, I asked a question and the question was, if anyone could uh, name a, an African luxury brand and I'm sure that that, that that idea was literally um, alien. I mean, 
who would even imagine that luxury will come out of Africa? Africa is not a place that luxury can be produced. And that prejudice itself, it's something that is problematic. It also filters into a curriculum, like Sean said, you definitely don't have anything uh, on the history of African luxury. Um, even curriculum on the continent uh, doesn't um, emphasize or in any way assert the fact that Africa has played a relevant role, not only in the global luxury economy, but even in the, in the global fashion economy. And so uh, right off the bat, um, places like Africa are disadvantaged. And, <clears throat> and I believe that in time, all of this will be resolved. Um, back to your question, this is actually where uh, people like myself, voices like myself come, come to play. I would, for example, I sort of stumbled into studying luxury in Africa by accident. I remember um, we had one of our fashion classes in a, in a luxury retail store. Uh, and this store literally put together brands, Western brands and a couple of South African brands. And sort of it, it ignited my, my interest. And I started digging and reading. And a lot of what I've done has been uh, self-motivated. It has been my own initiative, um, pulling together resources and digging deep. In fact, it has stirred in me the desire to sort of project and contribute uh, in a profound way to, to, to the global luxury con uh, conversation, something from Africa. Um, I see uh, our stories being projected uh, in the next five years. I see more voices following up to what I have already started. In fact, as I speak, I do have um, two interesting uh, book contracts. Uh, one that's going to be on um, a commercial book on African luxury and another a monograph on uh, African luxury. And I will be digging deep, in fact, bringing in the history of African luxury and attempting to decolonize uh, luxury in, in, the, in the very best way that's possible. And not just that, but also bringing on board what I believe if Africa is coming into the global luxury economy, it's not just enough to jump on the bandwagon. What is Africa contributing? Um, I discussed what I call Lux Ubuntu, uh, Africa's own pathways to the global luxury economy and what Africa con can contribute to the global luxury economy. Sorry, we had, a truck, we had a truck going past. It was rather loud. I muted myself. Um, thank you, Kenneth. That was really insightful. Um, I'm aware that it's gone 20 past uh, six slash 20 past one, depending where we are. And we were supposed to round this up at one. We have answered most of the questions. So this might be a good opportunity to hand back over to our wonderful organisers. Perhaps Sean or Veronica, you might want to come in here. Um, and unless that is, of course, if anyone on the panel has any really burning desire to answer anything or have any final very brief thoughts, um, now would be your time to raise your hand or forever hold your peace. No, I, I'd just like to say how much I appreciated um, um, what was just said, you know, about this idea of uh, what I would call proper decolonizing, which is to say we really go to the heart of the matter and we really deeply investigate that. I thoroughly look forward to reading that book. And I'm also taking on board this idea of the global luxury conversation needs to include other voices. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciated that on many levels. Thank you, Sheena, and thank you for taking part in this discussion yourself. Okay, well, in that case, um, thank you all very much. Thank you for, to the panellists. Thank you for having me as well. And thank you to our participants. Um, I'll now take this uh, opportunity to hand back over to Sean. Sean, are you there? I am. <laughs> no. thank um, uh, thanks, James. Um, well, it's been a really interesting day. It's um, been quite amazing. So I want to obviously, um, firstly, thank um, all the panellists, Chris and um, Andrew, for um, an amazing discussion in conversation this morning, which I'm sure is going to be listened to by loads and loads of people once it's um, um, uploaded as a podcast. Um, and of course, thank our panellists from the first panel. I don't need to thank myself, but uh, um, Veronica, who's been working obviously with me um, on this for um, on In Pursuit of Luxury for a very long time. Um, Federica and Ken, 
Um, so thank you to them for the uh, contribution to the first panel and Sheena, Simon, Federica, Mark and Silvio and Peter for the second panel. I mean, which was also really, really interesting. I mean, what's been amazing is that we've gone on journeys unforeseen. You know, who knew, who knew when we started what would be discussed? So I think that has been fantastic. So, um, you know, thank you to everybody. And Simon, I hope I thanked you as well. Um, I did, Sean, hopefully. Can I just ask a very quick, Sean, there's a quick, quick question coming from the audience here. Uh, are that we going to get the recording to all the sessions afterwards? Are you going to send that around? Yeah, so um, what we're going to do, yes, is the answer. What we will do is um, it will go for editing. Um, um, and then once Freddie has kindly um, done all the editing, we will then put it into, um, it won't be a visual um, 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 kind of outlook. It will just be a vocal one. So he's going to take all the sound and put it into a, a various podcasts. Um, and thank you, of course, to Nick, who you can nobody can see, but thanks to Nick and Tricia, who've also been helping um, with today. Um, we will be, um, as we said earlier, launching a um, with James, in fact, with Intellect, who have been very good um, to us in terms of sponsorship and all the support they've given us. Uh, we're launching the In Pursuit of Luxury Journal, which comes out in January 2022. And we're going to be um, um, set, uh, putting up... Um, a call for papers on the In Pursuit of Luxury website soon. We also have a podcast that's starting on the 12th of January. It starts season one, is called Formidable Women. Um, women in, um, I don't know, do I say powerful positions around the world? So they are either, you know, business women, um, we've got journalists, um, designers, manufacturers, um, PR gurus, data analysts. Um, so that's going to start on the 12th of December and we'll send all that information out. And then, of course, we have our um, May 2021 conference, which is on the 28th and 29th of May in collaboration with um, Chiara Colombi, who's a professor at the Politecnico in Milan. So all going well. Vaccines, inoculations or whatever you want to call them. Um, <laughs> we will hopefully be in Milan um, in May. Uh, Veronica, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, uh, like you, looking forward to that possibility. We had to postpone it once. And I'm glad we really did have a chance to have this format. And this is the first of, of, of many, I hope. And uh, thank you so much for participating. It was really quite a fascinating journey. Yeah. So we do hope that um, what would be what would be great is if um, any of you who are still there, um, if you thought this was an interesting day, if you could just email us at info at in pursuit of luxury dot com. Um, if you're interested in us doing um, another of these, uh, maybe in the um, in the new year. So I guess all that's left is to say thank you. Thank you to all of you um, for attending. Thank you all of you for speaking and we will sh um, ha uh, merry uh, merry holidays happy holidays because I, I know they have um, different holidays Hanukkah's tonight and Christmas is um, next month and um, so <laughs> happy holidays to everybody and hopefully we'll have a, a much better year next year than this one thank you bye thank you, thank you. Bye. bye everyone bye 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 to everyone bye everyone bye thanks Ken <laughs> James, thank you. Thank Gina, you so much. Peter. Thanks.